And welcome back again to another of your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast. Thought Riot Podcast. My name is Brendan. And I am Malia. Welcome to the show. Yes. And we commit to being honest, intelligent, unscripted. 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 It's true. And interesting conversations, bringing information we get, following it to wherever it leads, holding nothing back, and sharing brutal honesty the entire time because we censor nothing. And talk about everything. Yeah, round of applause, all you out there hanging out you in know, the studio. Talking about everything means that we're willing to dive into any topic when it comes to the cases that we cover, including topics that maybe aren't comfortable or seem far-fetched or seem controversial sometimes. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. That's a really, really, really good point. We are covering some of the uh, theories, opinions, topics that you're not going to hear at mainstream media sources because Either they feel too far-fetched, who knows, multiple of reasons, because um, marketers don't like it, the the commercials don't like it, um, and uh, but we don't have to deal with that here. So if you want to talk about it, then we want to talk about it. So we're going to dig into it. One thing I do want to say, though, is tonight we're going to speed things up a little bit. So, so close, so close to being done with my training that has been affecting the podcast for months now. All right. So uh, only a little bit longer, but we're going to speed things up tonight. We are uh, only going to cover just a few breaking news topics, and then we're going to get right into the case topics. So um, just make sure, make sure you do all the podcast things, hit all the podcast buttons, hit that like, hit that subscribe, hit that notification. We have a lot of people out there that are members and like supporting us. Uh, However, uh, just hitting the like button and leaving a comment under the video, not in the live comment section, but under the video does a lot. Like I can't even explain to you guys how much it does. Or leaving a review on a podcast platform. Boom. That. Exactly. So if you do one of those, we appreciate it big time. We are growing and we are growing fast. Uh, We are growing like, I don't know, 10% every month, which is insane. Um, So uh, that that's all because of you guys. So just Mm -hmm. keep it up and we're going to keep reminding you. Um, if you're enjoying the content, hit that subscribe button and you'll get more. We are literally on all social medias. We have Patreon, Discord. Discord invite is in the scrolling bar up at the top. If you don't know what Discord is, it is a free service similar to this live chat over here um, that uh, that just continues, right? So when something pops in your head and you want to share it with some people, oh man, I got this great idea or I made... I connected these dots, whatever, you know, it, it's essentially what it is. It's there. a chat room. Yeah, yep, it is. It is. So, um, but one of the great things about that is that you don't have to depend on YouTube notifications. We know how unreliable those are. So, uh, you get live notifications when content's coming out for the thought riot podcast and the true crime talk show. So, um, yeah, hop on there, check it out. Yes. Do that. Yeah, so uh, we are just going to hop right into the breaking news topics. Um, I guess for um, for our spotlight of the week, because we're trying to speed everything up just because I have reduced amount of time to do everything, editing and everything. Um, you know, we just want to thank everyone who's out there. We have a lot of content creators. I said this last week. I know that, but it. It's so important that it deserves to be said another time. Every week we have new content creators that are coming in our chat and 
Uh, that's exactly what we wanted from the beginning. We want to support everyone. We have content creators that are hopping in there that have wildly different opinions than what we have, and they feel comfortable coming in there and hanging out. And I think that's the important part. You know, uh, I think it's important for all of us that we're in a place where uh, we're confident enough in our beliefs and opinions that somebody coming in and, and scrutinizing them and questioning them shouldn't deter us, you know, from, from our goals and what we want to do. So, uh, just thank all of you, every single one of you, all of you, we, there is no bad blood between any other content creator out there. We love all of you. Um, and for everyone else, just make sure you're being respectful. That is the number one rule at Thought Riot Podcast is just respect everybody. Any topic can be talked about anything, absolutely anything, as long as it's talked about respectfully. So, yes, agreed. All right. So, um, what are your main topics tonight? So, um, my main topics or cases that I'm going to be going over tonight are going to be in no specific order. Well, maybe I'll do it in order. So Anna, oh gosh. Nets Trevic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I literally just looked this up how to pronounce it and I'm still butchering it. <laughs> um, but anyway, this woman is from Florida and she's going through a very bitter divorce and went to Spain and she's been missing for a couple weeks, like two weeks. Um, and it's a, it's a rough situation. Um, it's highly suspicious, the circumstances she went missing in. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot of eyes on the case. And mm -hmm. thankfully mainstream media just started talking about it very, very recently. Uh, but I wanted to talk about it. I really hope she gets found. Um, Anyway, I'm going to be going over that, and I'm going to be going over retracing Koberger's drive on his way home to Pullman directly after the crime. Interesting. Um, I wanted to see what that time frame would be. Like, we've all seen the map from the PCA. Well, I was under the impression it was a very particular road that he was cutting highway to highway across. Um, and I was wrong which road that was. Mm. Um, so I tried my best to like map it out and, you know, try to make it look similar to the PCA. Um, there's, I narrowed it down and between like an hour and six to an hour and 11 minutes. And um, I think it's really, really interesting. So I'm going to yeah, go over that. I took a screen recording, basically going through the whole map. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, which I hope you can put on the screen as we're yeah. talking about it. Um, and also the Freemason connection in Delphi, Indiana. Oh. Um, we know there's a lot going on in the Delphi uh case right now, meaning Richard Allen and Abby um and Liberty, their tragic murder in 2017. We're we just passed the seven year anniversary. Um, the judge is making strange decisions. The prosecutor is making strange decisions to the point where it's got literally everybody scratching their heads and like, what is going on here? Yeah. Like, what is the connection between these people? And while I don't know if this is the connection Two of the potential suspects, right? It's yeah. interesting. It's really, really, really interesting. So Awesome. So mine, I am going to be going through uh, the unfortunate ending, uh, accidental ending of Hudson Lindlow. Um, Lindow? Lindow, I'm sorry. Um, it, Hudson Lindow was uh, a student, specifically a Sigma Chi student out of uh, Moscow, Idaho, and it's one of the strange um, deaths that we've seen in that area that when we were covering the 4chan topics, um, we started digging into these. We just took a break from it for a while. We, you know, we're looking in some other directions and then just now coming back to it. So it, it's interesting. It's interesting how little information there is, but we're going to talk about it. Um, 
Number two, I am going to be going into the 4chan theory again, aka frat boy theory. And uh, we are going to do a full review of everything we talked about previously. Previously, if you haven't seen this video, you need to um, because it gets down into the very microscopic details of Greek life and some of the pros and cons about it and why we felt like it is a uh, good area to look into. There's some very questionable things there. Well, we're going to review all of it. We're going to talk through it all. Very loose conversation talking about why we feel like this is such a big deal in this case um, and everything having to do with it. And then number three, we are going into the Denise Huskins case, a.k.a. the real-life Netflix documentary Gone Girl. Hmm. Gone Girl? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So we have reduced breaking news stories. We're only going to be doing a few of them, just some of the most important updates right now. So let's get into it. Breaking news, thought right podcast style of the week. And uh, number one here, we are going through the new document for the Idaho for Brian Koberger case where if you've watched us at all, you know what we're talking about. But if you're new here, welcome. Super glad to have you here. But uh, it, it is the Idaho 4 massacre where four uh, college students unfortunately lost their lives. Brian Koberger is the focus, and we are very intently focusing on this case. So anytime new documents come out, we give you the rundown of it. So here we go. This dropped on uh, February 12th, 2024. In the District Court of Second Judicial District of the State of Idaho, in and for County of Lata, uh, order setting hearing based on the defendant's motion to allow certain experts and investigators protected access to view IgG materials. Uh, defendant's motion requesting clarification of the sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protection order and the state's request for scheduling order. The court orders the following. A hearing on the above motions is set for February 28, 2024 at 1 p.m. This hearing will be open to the public and will be live streamed on the court's YouTube channel. As to scheduling, counsel shall be prepared to address scheduling, both a briefing schedule and oral argument on defendant's motion for change of venue, a discovery cutoff deadline, expert disclosure deadlines, deadlines for filing any pretrial motions such as motions to suppress or motions to... Uh, Lemonade. Lemonade. Yeah. Motions in lemonade. And dates for a trial dated this 11th day of February 2024. John C. Judge, District Judge. All right. So it sounds like we're making progress here. We don't really know uh, how this is going to go, though, right? Because uh, we know that the original plan was to have a uh, trial date set for this summer. Although the more we look at this, the less likely it seems possible. Right. And you have uh, Ann Taylor, the defendant's attorney, public defender coming forward and saying, look, there's no I, it doesn't matter what you have going on. There's no way we're going to be ready this summer. So uh, this is going to be talking about that. Hopefully we'll see some kind of progress there and get some more information. Uh, it's interesting seeing that we're talking about some very heavy hitter topics here. Well, yeah, I mean, setting the hearing is interesting, but the IgG material, I'm interested to hear a little bit about, you know, what the defense is doing, like see if we can get some hints of, you know, what they're doing behind the scenes to investigate it. Um, I'm curious if any of that will come up at all since they're talking mm. about that protective order. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's a, any way. I mean, they might schedule it for this summer, but I don't even think it's possible that she could be ready. Um, I see a lot of people saying it's delay tactics, but yeah, if we take good faith argument from her, like there's uh, nothing wrong with her delaying it though. No, no, no. I, 
I don't think so either. I don't think so either. But it, it's important to take into account the tactics of an attorney, right? So, like, I get everybody's argument that thinks, oh, they're just trying to delay. They're just trying to delay the inevitable. One, I don't think they see it as delaying the inevitable. The more time you have, the better your defense is going to be. So you try and get as much time as you can. Also, and that also gives her investigators time. Well, and that also, the more time that pass, passes, generally, okay, this case is an anomaly, I'm not going to deny. But generally, the more time that passes, the more people forget. So actually, a lot of defense lawyers in a case like this would like to have a delay um, because they're trying to get an impartial jury. I And that's pretty fair. I don't see that being unfair. The whole point in having a jury is, uh, is an impartial jury. <laughs> but uh, I'm curious what you guys think about it. This was a quick one, but I think it's a very important one. So keep an eye out. Uh, if we can go live during this, we will. Um, if we can't, then we'll be talking about it the day after or soon right after. Yep. So let us know. All right. So next breaking news update. We did talk about this on the True Crime Talk Show just because it literally came out that day or maybe the day before and it was important. And I think it should be on both shows because it's Everybody needs to keep an eye out. So we covered yes. the Rachel Morin case a while back. It was about six months ago when that happened. Um, August 6, 2023. She was 37 years old and was the mother of five children. Um, she went hiking on or for a run on the Mom Pa Trail in Bel Air, Maryland, um, and didn't make it back home. Mm. Um, she was later found by basically civilians, um, you know, just people of the public that were searching for her, uh, with the police yeah, and I think an underage girl and her, her dad. Unfortunately. Well, her dad wasn't there. Um, but she called her dad and told her what she saw and it was a horrific scene. Um, absolutely awful. Um, she was snatched off the trail and, you know, drugged to some big train tunnels, um, and horribly savagely attacked. Um, this guy got away. Um, they got DNA from the crime scene. They ran it through CODIS and then they got a hit, but it's an un unidentified man who also committed a crime a few months back in LA uh, previous to this. So they went and looked for that. They found uh, ring doorbell footage of him leaving that home. And now we have more details on mm. what happened at that home. And we officially have a sketch of this man um, putting it up on the screen. If you can't see the screen because you're just listening to audio, please go look up the new sketch in uh, Rachel Morin's case. Um, share it with everybody, especially Hispanic um, communities, because they believe he is Hispanic. The crime, where the crime happened in LA was in a Hispanic neighborhood. Um, and from all accounts, it's if you're not Hispanic walking around that neighborhood, you are the odd one out. You're a sore um, thumb. You're yep. a sore thumb and you will become a target. So it makes sense. And based off of the way he looked in that video, uh, which might I add, he walked very casually out of that home um, after assaulting somebody and a child and was kicked out by other family members in the home. Um, the Hartford Sheriff's Department released a podcast giving more details surrounding the investigation with this new sketch. Um, and they officially said she was found by the drainage uh, tunnels because we knew that from that person that found her, that young girl, from her father doing an interview. Mm -hmm. So we knew that, but they were trying to like, they came out and denied it and said it wasn't true. They were trying to keep that close to the vest for the integrity of the investigation, which I understand. 
but uh, unfortunately it was already out there all over the internet um, that that's where she was found. But they, they said officially that is what happened and she was drug and you know, there was um, a bloody trail. Now they're not sure if Rachel Morin was targeted or not. Um, they have no idea. Uh, but the investigator who was talking the podcast said it's in his gut that she was so targeted. Some sort of stalking, saw her, followed her, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they think so. I mean, that's just what he feels about it. But um, this man, there's two sketches. So there's yeah, one of clear, just his face. Opinion, though. There's just no evidence. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. So there's one of just his face, and then there's one with him, a red and black Jordan's hat on. And that is the hat that he left at the L.A. crime scene where they supposedly got his DNA. Um, by all accounts, every expert I've heard talk on this and law enforcement officer has said that they believe he's escalating and this is going to be a serial killer. Mm. Um, so he is a threat to literally anyone and everyone, um, that's on the North American continent. <laughs> like yeah. they think he could have fled to Mexico by now, They, he, but he could be anywhere. Um, the scope of this crime is just, I can't explain it enough. I, I, I personally don't like to use like really graphic sounding uh, words, but it, it was so graphic, man. I mean, he used a rock. He, yeah. He used on a, her head. a rock until she wasn't, you know, alive anymore. Um, yeah. But worse than that, like past the point of not being alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mutil it was like mutilation. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure he did other things. We're not sure how he left DNA at the crime scene. Um, but it's a, a lot of people are speculating that it was SA. Um, you know, she was nude the way she was found. And it's it's horrible. Like she was a mother of five children. One is autistic and young. One is a is a, you know, I think she might be 18, but she's like a teenager. Um, you know, and the rest are pretty young children. It's absolutely mm -hmm. horrible. Her family, including her ex-husband, have been out doing uh, interviews um, all over the place. And uh, the interview room actually did a really good interview with her brother and her ex-husband recently and showed new pictures of her. So I highly recommend that recent episode. Um, and they talked about a lot more details too. Um, Chris McDonough actually worked in the neighborhood that Los Angeles crime happened. Um, so he has pretty good input on that location that I appreciate. Um, but yeah, I just, I need, I think this needs to be spread everywhere. I shared it with, um, you know, Hispanic people in my family, in my circle, and I suggest literally everybody share it with everyone, uh, because they, yeah. it's, very likely he knew the area somehow he had family there um it's and who knows where he's going next uh i just know that people sometimes overlook a sketch they think oh that looks like somebody i know but no way it could be that person um they would never do that or they second guess themselves i urge you not to don't second guess yourself if this legit looks like somebody you know just have them checked out. If it's not the person, it's not the person. Like no harm, no foul. I mean, it could be, it could be anybody. You know what I mean? Like he could be so friendly to your face. You would have no idea. Mm -hmm. I urge you all to, um, you know, if you see somebody that looks like this, if you, Think you know somebody that may know this person in, you know, Los Angeles, please call Harford Chair Department, um, you know, send in a tip. It could go a long way. Yep. Rachel mm -hmm. Moore needs justice and so does her whole family, including her five children. Yep. If you see something, say something. Definitely. But we will continue updating on this case as, you know, information becomes available. Um, I'm just, I'm really banking on this one. I really hope that they find him before there's another victim. It was, his cool down time was li literally months. Yeah, and if he scary. hadn't been stopped at that Los Angeles home, 
who knows what would have happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's unfortunate. But that's it. All right. So this next update that we have for you is actually something that you sent me today that I, I want to talk about. And we have we've talked about this a couple times actually, just not on the show before. So there have been some content creators that have brought out this 4chan post, okay? And we're going to get into 4chan. For anybody that's new here, The la- you know the last time we put out a 4chan uh, or frat boy topic, uh, we had like half the subs that we have now. So, um, you know, there might be a lot of people, a lot of new people here that haven't heard of it or didn't watch that video. Um, but uh, on this 4chan post um whoever is doing it let's start the conversation like that whoever's posting this wants you to believe that it's jack s yeah yeah show walter hoodie guy yes hoodie guy and uh he says uh i've watched long enough to see how this works now it might get screenshot but by tomorrow, ain't nobody going to care anyways. No one will probably believe it anyways. That's fine by me. I was trying to look after the girls that night and was supposed to give them a ride home. They ditched me and took off while I was talking to a bigger guy at the f- talking to the bigger guy at the food truck. Can't remember his name. Anyway, the guy told me the girls were leaving and that's why I was like, what, what the F, uh, because I was supposed to take them home. Man, if they had just let me take them home, they would be alive. Do you guys understand? I didn't go to Boise or Africa. I went home and went to sleep. Was woke up on Sunday to phone calls telling me what the heck happened. Uh, It kills me to know if they would have waited on me, they would probably be alive right now. I hate myself for it. So I got a couple things to say. Y'all are supposed to be smart. Please figure this out. I've had a couple to drink. Ain't no way a K bar could do what got done to my friends. More than one person, too. The law got the wrong driver on purpose. Where you think a sheath like that could come from? Major pain. So. I. I don't believe any of it. And, uh, when I'm looking at these things, okay, my first thought is, is there any information in here that isn't so obviously known and covered by mainstream media? No. All of it is very important mainstream media topics. Yeah. Every single piece. There's nothing in here that is like, Oh yeah, this is Jack. I I had some additional information. No, he used the mainstream media topics to uh, not only try to prove that he is who he says he is, but then he also leans on um, your empathy by saying, you know, I hate myself for it. I've got a couple drinks in me. That's like, that is Hollywood movie stuff. Oh my gosh, I hate myself. I'm going to go drink and you know what I mean? That that's trying to play on those human emotions People to get don't. you bought into what's being said here, but there's nothing being said here that's any different from anything that we've seen. Nothing. Yeah, it's most likely somebody trolling. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But like, was there ever a time where cause in that it says they got the public driver wrong on purpose? Or the private driver wrong on purpose? Like, was there ever a time where people thought it was one person and then it wasn't? Not that I can remember, but I didn't dig into this. I just wanted to cover this because this is important to the topics we're about to cover. 
because there is information in the other 4chan and there are timelines and there are details where it is literally the opposite of this. And I want to be able to point out the differences in the two, right? Uh, I will never believe anything online when somebody's trying to make a plea in this way and they're using the same information that everybody else gets. Okay, if you're close to the case, then you know more. You know what I mean? You're not going to come out with just the basic of the most basic and uh and try and troll that that's just what i think it is um that's what i think it is there's a lot of reasons out there why someone might troll in this way too you know i think that uh you don't even have to be a horribly heinous person to post something like that i think you could just be wanting to get attention feel some kind of you know um adrenaline like oh they are talking about it you know what i mean you feel like you have some kind of power because you posted this up there i i do not think well that this is I mean, jackass you know we know from dot okay the infamous dot that went on all these shows um claiming to have literally been a witness to people going in the home that night or early morning and partying next door they wanted attention like they wanted to feel important. They mm -hmm. wanted to feel because like, I think the situation is, is that there's a lot of people that are feeling, you know, that are have trauma. Okay. That are feeling lonely, that want to feel important, that want to feel, you know, like they matter. Um, everyone feels lonely. I just want to clarify yeah, that, that that's a, but very the trauma human, part is important. Yeah. That's a very human, uh, emotion. And, you know, it, it, it's very easy to get things confused. Uh, and I, I'm not pointing this at anyone or have anyone in mind. I'm, I'm thinking from specifically a, uh, like from a therapy background or psychology background where, uh, you know, somebody that is going through something and hasn't completely coped with that yet might not even have the realization of what they're doing exactly, but they see so much attention on these people yep. and they want that attention, but don't know how to verbalize what they're feeling. So they might make a decision to post something like this to get that, get a small craving, get that little fill of, uh, you know, that, that feeling of importance or attention. Um, and, uh, to me, that's just what it feels like based on the things that are put in here. It is, it, it's too perfect. It is too perfect in, in, in a way of the trolling we've seen before. There is some intentional pull on empathy, your human emotion. Yeah. Uh, there is nothing in here that proves that it's not some random person. I could hop on here and do it. You could hop on there and do this. You could hop on there and do this. If you know anything about this case, this is the most basic of the most basic information in here. Um, so anybody could hop on there and do it. Therefore, um, I just think somebody that's closer to the case, right? Because I would consider Jackass the real one uh, closer to this case w would be able to connect those dots and know if, like, why, who, okay. why are these people going to believe me? You well, know? And for one, if you really are Jackass, okay. And you want to come out and say something, drop some information about the case and you know that stuff. Why wouldn't you say what you and Maddie were talking and Kaylee were talking about? In that video. Yeah. You know what I mean? For sure. Like, there's way more important things Jack could talk about than that. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm curious what you guys think about it. Uh, I just wanted to touch on it because I do think it's important that you guys know about it because information is power and and knowing what to look for in this. Like, I, I suggest you take it, maybe pause the video and, and just... Look for what I'm talking about. That look for the the very basic uh, understanding of this crime. That's all that's in there, and then the rest of it is trying to like, oh, I hate myself for this. I, you know what I mean? Like trying to draw connection with uh, your empathy, which isn't right. Like it's that's not okay. So who whoever wrote this, uh, if it's Jack, I, I tend to feel like. I'm confident it's not right. Um, yeah. But uh, whoever it is, like, 
you'd get a you'd get a way better reaction using your brain to have a regular conversation with people. Um, so yeah, it, this just doesn't help anybody. No, I don't want to come off too harsh, but this just doesn't help anybody, right? Every decision is doing one of two things: that you're either helping a situation or you're hurting it. There's no such thing as just staying stagnant that doesn't exist um so i think something like this hurts a situation yeah and like you said there's no insider information in that like yeah. literally not a single speck mm -mm. nothing no and so. and somebody that is jack writing would have enough information to be able to at least prove it it doesn't even have to have anything to do with the case you could have gave something personal i think yeah. anybody understands that right mm -hmm. so um, but check it out. Let me know what you guys think about it. That's it. All right, you guys. We are moving out of the breaking news of the week by Thought Right Podcast. And we are moving into our true crime cases of the week. Wham bam. For me, I, I think I'm going to start with the uh, Denise Huskins case. Okay. So what's interesting, and I did this on purpose, I have not watched the Netflix documentary. And, and there's a reason why. Uh, when I'm doing research into a case, number one, I really enjoy the feedback I get from people. Like, it, there's this idea out there that, like, you can tell when people are responding to you like, oh, I'm calling you out for having wrong information. You know what I mean? And and I just feel like that is probably somebody that doesn't understand the concept of Thought Riot podcast uh, because we're here to learn together. So I'm going to have wrong information. But the people that are sharing their information, like it's so smart. It blows me away on a daily basis basis i am blown away by the comments that our community leaves us with ideas and information and uh you know uh, general details of cases opinions preferences uh and all things that come with it so uh i didn't want to watch that because i didn't want the subjectivity of a video to like cloud that you know what i mean sure so i started doing research on this and it is one of the craziest cases i've ever seen in my life you guys absolutely do you know much about it no oh my gosh okay there's really interesting questions in here that i would really love to talk about towards the end uh so let's get through it okay i i'm gonna stay off the subjective parts um and what i mean by that just general rundown is we're going to be talking about two people okay we're going to be talking about an aaron quinn and a denise huskins and these two people were together they were having some relationship ups and downs during that time like any relationship there was some issues with like flirting and uh cheating uh not physically but like some communication with exes things like that right so just ups and downs they were brand new relationship working through some things they they got hot and heavy pretty quick um but uh anyways so they were hanging out at uh at at their house at uh uh Aaron Quinn's house okay and uh they went to bed for the night um and they're hanging out at the house with the intention of working through like these relationship issues they were having and stuff like that so it was supposed to be like a bonding experience right um well they wake up in the middle of the night all right with uh a sound then get up to see what that is and they are flooded in their eyes and in the room with lights and laser pointers. What? Yeah. What's the first thing you think of? What year is this? Like you didn't give the year and location. Yeah. 2015. Okay. Um, so in it's Southern California, it's all over Southern California though. Okay. Um, so laser pointers. Um, what's the first thing you think of? 
I would think sniper rifles. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or okay. some type of gun that has a laser on it. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, well, from there, um, they're trying to figure out like what is going on. You know, can you imagine just waking up out of bed and like having a bright light in your face and this laser pointer? And I would probably hit the ground. No, I'm I would. Dead too. serious. I would too. I would think it was somebody trying to shoot me. Correct. For sure. Absolutely. So, um, in comes somebody. Okay instructs them to get down uh instructs them to tie each other up with zip ties okay um and and this is according to aaron quinn this is what is being shared with the police officers right so i'm, I'm recanting his uh statement he gave um that person then directs them into uh the closet all right gives them each headphones like I don't know where my headphones are, but over the ear headphones, totally covered. All right. Like wireless headphones, high tech stuff puts um, goggles on them, like swimming goggles on them, but painted black. So they're sitting in there together with goggles on zip tied hands, um, muffled ears and muffled ears. All right. And they're trying to figure out like, what is going on? What you imagine how scary that is, you know, um, they, the person did tell them, as long as you listen, everything will be okay. We're not here to hurt you. We're here for a purpose. Um, but so a minute goes by, then all of a sudden they start hearing noise on the headphones. It is a pre-recorded audio recording, uh, telling them, that everything is going to be okay, that uh, giving them the general rundown of the plan that's going on, they're there for a mission. They are there for, they. It, it's a targeted approach. As long as they give them what they want, nobody's life is at jeopardy. N nobody is in risk of being physically harmed or anything like that. Um, and uh, it, it continues to talk about like where they're from, streets they grew up at, things like that, right? The victims? Correct. Yes. So they did their research on them? Yes. Whoa. Yes. Um, That's crazy. And uh, so they come back in, okay? And I'm trying to speed this up so we can get to the important questions. If you guys want more details, let me know on this. This is a very interesting case. And I could always come back to this and and do an add-on where I'm specifically talking about the situation. Because I think just this situation could be a 30-minute video on its own, literally. Like, that's how detailed this was. It well, is insane. You know, I've started considering for certain cases, maybe starting... Um, <laughs> A podcast or or just doing videos yeah. that are scripted and going through those like minute details telling the story yeah yeah but uh yeah maybe that's you know a spinoff of you know mm -hmm. but uh anyways so the what i'm getting at what i'm trying to explain here is this is very well put together. So when I'm hearing this and I'm reading this and I'm putting myself into their position, my initial thought, okay, would be, am, am, am I being held up by, uh, like the CIA? That's what or I would think. <laughs> a military operation yep. or, um, you know, an overseas country's military operation. Like this is insane, you know? Yep. Um, that's what I would think. And, and what's crazy is the person that talked to them had a voice changer too. Okay. Oh. So yeah. And um, so they go in there, they have, they have now gathered their computers, their electronics. They come in there one at a time, take their headphones and glasses off and ask them very specific information. I need the password to your bank account. I need the password to your email accounts. I need the password to your computer. I need the password to your anything personal safety protocol type stuff, right? 
they give it. They're terrified, of course. Why would you not give it? Banks uh, have insurance for this type of thing, you know? Um, so they give it to them. They go away again, and they start hearing the recording. And it's a it's an in-between of the recording of this personal information, telling them what's going on, and like elevator music, calming elevator music. Yeah. What the so heck? It's, dude, when I was first reading this, I was blown away. I thought this was a joke, and I'm not even joking. Um, so after a while they come back in and they split the two of them up. Um, and, uh, something is realized at that time. All right. So there is with the, the subjective information, right. And I'll try and keep it as objective as possible. That whole drama that was going on between the two of them, he, he, uh, Aaron Quinn had been in a relationship with somebody else. Um, and I don't want to put her name on blast. She's gotten quite a bit of hate from it this, was an affair, not an affair. He was in a long-term relationship before, uh, Denise. Okay. And, uh, it ended bad. Like he, she had been cheating on him for a long time, yada, yada, whatever. They felt like uh, there was no closure. He ended up getting with Denise. Uh, and because that no closure, there was some conversation going on on the side. He never did anything physical with her, but they talked enough for, I think anybody to be like, what the heck, dude, that's not okay. You know, if you're in a relationship with me, yeah. um, but the guy comes in, starts talking to him, and realizes and and asks Denise, "Hey, are you this person?" And she was like, "What? That's not me." And he said the name of Aaron's ex. Oh, yeah. And uh, so then they start asking, like, clarifying or verifying questions. Well, do do these two people look the same? Do they have the same hair color, same height? And yes, yes, yes. Checking all the boxes. So uh, I don't know if they believe him or not at first, but they separate the two. They take her into, they call it like the computer room or something like that and uh, leave Aaron in there um, and continue going to work. Come back in, ask him for more information, passwords, personal stuff, whatever. Um, and uh, ultimately, okay, speeding this up here, they come in and they bring him to the living room. They set him up with a way to get himself free, right, from his uh, zip ties. And they tell him that um, you are not allowed to leave this yellow line. And they have tape put on the ground. We have cameras installed in your house. Uh, we are taking Denise, and this is not to harm her. She will be okay, and everything will be okay. But this is to ensure that you uh, pay the ransom that we're requesting, the $8,500. So once you pay the $8,500, you'll be good. This is how you're going to do it. I left you very detailed instructions, and we'll be communicating with you through email. Do not call police. Do not do everything. We are in all of your in your phones. We can see you at all times. Um, and he said, you know, you're going to have to uh, reach in to reach out to Denise's job because they worked at the same hospital and let him know that, hey, I have a family emergency. I won't be coming in this week. Then you need to reach out to your job and let him know that, hey, I'm having an emergency. I need to have a couple days off. Next, you're going to go to the bank and you're going to take your phone with you and you are going to withdraw this $8,500 and you're going to uh, get it over to us in a very specific way. All this was very, very, very specific. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, he agrees, whatever. And then uh, he, he leaves uh, and, oh, I, I can't believe I forgot this. So during this, they made him take pills and drinks so they drugged them and that's important for this part of the story that's why i forgot about it uh they don't have any concept of how much time they were in the closet but because he was drugged um he woke up and uh you know cut himself free but was so tired from being drugged he he called he did the phone stuff and ended up passing back out again woke up later around midday <clears throat> and that's when he saw the tape, you know, realized the phone was going on. He, they had reached out to him through his own email to make it look like he was emailing himself oh. and said, you know, this is what you're going to do. Uh, and he started 
they he they said he's not allowed to reach out to any cops, okay, or anything like that. Well, his brother's an FBI agent, um, and uh, Aaron Aaron Quinn's brother is. So Aaron didn't reach out to him for multiple hours, trying to wrap his head around this of what's going on. You know, these guys in full black wetsuits, body suits, come in here, and and it, it feels like it's something out of a movie. You know what I mean? Literally out of a movie. But on the couch, he's sitting there and notices that the camera that's posted in the corner is making some weird noises. So he thinks, maybe it's not working. Maybe it's running out of batteries. Maybe I have a chance to actually get ahead of this thing, right? And Denise is gone. He calls his brother, the FBI agent, and says, look, this is what's going on. His brother says, hang up now. Call 911. So he calls 911. And uh, and and an officer comes right over, okay? And he starts giving him the entire story, the rundown of uh, what is going on. And uh, I've went back and forth whether I'm going to give this officer's name or not. And, and I don't, I'm not going to, because there's a civil lawsuit open right now. And I don't want anything going out there that could affect the case for, uh, Denise and Aaron Quinn. You know what I mean? Trying to make it seem like, Oh, well, Denise and Aaron Quinn aren't the victims. They put put this information out there. And, uh, the real victim is this officer, right? And just to be clear, this officer was a complete idiot, complete and absolute idiot. Cop gets there. He's telling him the whole story. His immediate response is, is you know, I, I don't believe you. We're going to search the house. I, I don't believe you. Um, they bring him in for questioning and start interrogating him hard, dude. Like, what did you do with her? What did, without even doing a full investigation, Okay. I see. I so for one, yeah, it's super messed up. But for two, I understand why they immediately were suspicious of him. I do. T- I, I understand I get it, it too. But there's a difference between believing and thinking that and being able to prove it. That's where my issue comes in. Is these guys were throwing hail marys the entire time, fully backing what they thought they knew. And that's the problem. Right. You weren't letting the evidence lead you. Yeah. You were just. You can have your opinion, but you need to prove that. Okay. And so the cop does not believe this. Thinks he totally made it up, dude. So he's questioning him hard. And like he's using convicted names like Scott Peterson and throwing it at this guy. So we're. Do you understand what's going to happen when I go to the media and let them know what's going on here? Do you realize you're going to be the next Scott literally threatening him like that? Like I'm, I'm, I'm not explaining how severe it was. So, uh, Aaron's in tears That's halfway through this being threatened by these officers. And he just went through a, a horrible traumatic event. Okay. And no, it doesn't feel real. no. It does not seem likely. The The details of this are insane, you guys. This is literally Hollywood movie stuff yeah, going on it's, here. And I understand how unbelievable it is, but as a police officer, you have to entertain it. I agree you with you. You have to. I agree like, with wh- you. They didn't look at the emails? I, they didn't try to get it over to an IT expert? I agree. Well, there's more to it. I agree with you. Um And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've always said, just being related to criminal stuff when I was way younger, like most of you guys know of our viewers, uh, criminals do the best when you live in the unbelievable. So if you make whatever crime you're doing be on an, in an unbelievable level, Nobody's going to believe it because all the law enforcement run off statistical averages. And I'm obsessed with statistics. I think statistics are phenomenal because the majority of the time you're going to be right. It's going to be these one off situations. You're going to be wrong. But statistically, like every other, 
Yes. They like they the, completely yep. ignored the symbolism and all of that. Um correct. Completely ignored it because correct. it's too unbelievable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So um and they, I I understand why. I yeah. get it. Yeah. I get it. It's just a problem because there are those one off situations. They yep. exist. Yep. So um, they continue interrogating him. They keep him away from his family. He uh, asks for a lawyer multiple times. Um, they don't give him one. Um, they are threatening, you know, to uh, expose him to the media, throw this out. And they actually do. They actually do talk to the media and uh, are awful, dude. Absolutely awful. Just. It, they end up making comments like, well, can you guys imagine our spot and how much money we put into this investigation? And then being what we believe is misled, like it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Um, but uh, anyway, so they the cops finally give him attorney, finally let his brother come in there and he just breaks down in tears, you know, cause he just got, he just went through this horrible event and not to mention, we're talking about like his civil rights, um, being trampled all over. Well, he's being she's accused still missing. He's being accused of doing something to her and she's missing, like missing, you know, nobody's looking for her. Correct. That's Absolutely. Terrifying. She is missing. Um, so a whole day goes by, um, and it just says that the, the Vallejo Police Department in Southern California, Vallejo, Southern California, this happens in Huntington Beach, Vallejo, which is, there's good money there, you know? Um, but, uh, they, they, they treat this case with skepticism, use publicity to try to make Aaron out to be the bad guy. To character assassinate. To character assassinate because they believe he was the one who did this. <sighs> um, telling her family that it was him. Um, and it, it was so absurd. That's horrid. Yeah. Yeah. Her family? Yep. Ugh. Yep. Yeah. So uh, another day goes by. OK. And uh, so we're now on March 25th. This happened on the 23rd. Uh, a ransom demand of eight thousand five hundred dollars is, is sent to Denise Huskins father via email. All right. And. Uh, that same day, later that same day. She is found at her parents' house hours away from Vallejo in Huntington Beach, California, alive and free. Couldn't get in her parents' house because her parents have traveled all the way down to where their house was. Um, she gets a hold of them through a neighbor's phone, and the police approach her. And, uh, and you know, they... They join the investigation. Her dad gets her a lawyer right away. Now, the police do this, okay? Start questioning her, finding out what's going on. And uh, the police come out initially before hearing anything and say that she's at fault now and start blaming her. That's where this Gone Girl narrative comes from. Have you ever seen Gone Girl? Yes, where I have. He sets it up. Yes. Okay, well, they believe that they tried saying that she uh, found out that he was talking to his ex and she set this up Are in less than 24 me? hours notice and ran with this story. So she goes into hiding. Okay, but here's the background of this. So from her perspective, all this has been going on with Aaron the whole time. All right. But when D Denise left, she was put into a trunk. All right. And she was told the whole time that, you know, you'll be fine. Just don't fight, whatever, right? She gets taken somewhere to a cabin somewhere, whatever. And she has a very good description of what the room is. They uh, secure her to a bed um, and and they tell them, you know, once everything comes through, the money comes through, we'll let you go and, and you'll be fine. Um, 
Well, this person uh, said they have one rule that they got to have blackmail on somebody in order they're too much. Otherwise, they're too much of a risk. OK, well, because she was the wrong woman, he didn't have any blackmail on her. So. Um, this is so messed up. Um, so she's R worded. Uh, and the the person that took her said, you know, I'm really sorry. I have to do this. I don't want to do this. Um, she heard arguing between people outside of the room. Uh, it got escalated. It got, they got mad and they weren't okay with this situation, but they didn't know what else to do. So they videotaped her, um, you know, having sex with one of these guys that, that, that stole her, that kidnapped her. All right. And the worst part about it is, uh, when they were done, th one of them came back in and was like, we have to do it again because you didn't look believable. So multiple times she was assaulted during this stay of hers. Um, and it caused a whole bunch of friction between these multiple people before she was let go. Um, but uh, so she was let go. Right. And back to the story where we were, she's in hiding because the police are trying to blame her and Aaron or just her or Aaron. It, it honestly felt like chaotic madness with the police. You know what I mean? It's Did like they get... didn't care who they were targeting. Hold on. What? Did they do an essay kit on her? No, no. Um, so the lawyer suggested, hey, let's get this kit done and let's get it done quick and the cops pushed it off you just go to a hospital I, yourself and get it done okay the cops they, don't need to have anything to do with it the cops pushed it off um so it didn't get done until later and and i don't have details around what that ended up being because okay. i just because why be he they ended up catching somebody okay well i just want to say like if you're ever in a situation like just go to the hospital immediately. Get it done as soon as possible. That is so important. Yeah. I wish somebody took her to a hospital. Like, right away. So, I, I agree with you. The captors, during all this, become offended with the police. <laughs> they email the police and essentially say how dare you for doing what you're doing we these two were kidnapped they were kidnapped by us what? i swear i'm not making this up <laughs> what yes and they said if, if you don't then they threatened the police if you don't come out publicly and apologize to them um you know we're gonna reach out to the media to make sure that they know, you know, how ill-equipped you are essentially. And they send two emails to police. The police officers do come out and make an apology, half-hearted one. It's a, in my opinion, it's a disgusting apology. Um, but, uh, you know, they end up saying like, we're not going to be contacting you anymore. And they don't ever find out who these guys are. The police continue to pursue them. And it's like Aaron and Denise are constantly fighting to stay away from the cops. They're both lawyered up and everything. But the interesting thing here, before we get into like the details around it, we see all the time where cops have good intentions. I truly think these cops probably had good intentions. But their statistics misled them in this situation. There is nobody that is going to think that either of these two people were involved. Yeah, because criminal profiling, um, you know, a lot of their decisions they make with areas to start in their investigations are based off statistics. They really are. Yeah. I know, I know, but if we started retraining police um, to be able to manage trauma and, and approach situations uh, 
from empathy, right? If there's not a gun out or a knife out, why wouldn't you approach every situ- situation with respect and empathetic? Like, I don't understand. You're going to get more than being accusatory and yeah, if you're stand off and yeah. aggressive, if you're accusatory off the rip, that person's not going to trust you. And what you have to understand is if they don't trust you, they're not going to be as loose lipped. OK, and if they are lying, you're going to end up catching them in lies eventually, especially if they're super willing to talk to you because you're not an a-hole accusing them of things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I. I do know. I'm just sitting here thinking as I'm talking through it because, you know, as I was reading on this, these were questions I was asking myself is like, dude, I I just don't understand how the cops could do this in this situation. Two, should that be allowed the the gross abuse of media to say, you know what? I believe it's you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out in front of the nation's cameras and say that you're the next Scott Peterson. No, it shouldn't be. That's so offensive. That is so manipulative. You, in my opinion, you've effectively become the criminal. You are the aggressor, dude, with no evidence. Like he wasn't arrested. He was not arrested. And the cops are pushing this narrative and then come out, like I said, and play the poor me card here. Once they realize like, oh, shoot, these two people were kidnapped. She was taken, not only just taken, but sexually assaulted twice. And we're over here doing this. And then they come out and like, well, you guys need to understand where we were coming from. You need to understand how much money we put into this investigation. Uh, You need to understand. No, nobody needs to understand anything. Your job is to serve the public. Like talking about how much money you spent, you didn't spend that. You did not spend that, dude. What? Who spent that is the people that you're supposed to be protecting that is their money. Yeah. So this idea of like we spend money, right. no, the public spends money. You you put money from the public into this investigation and then you're claiming like ownership over it. That's strange. To Even me. if it's not tax dollars, then it goes into debt. And inflation rises and we pay for it anyway. It's all coming from tax dollars or um, businesses from the U.S. Like that, that is. It is the public's money. Absolutely. So just so we're not lingering on this too long, because we could bring up so many topics with this case, so many disgusting topics and, and issues within police in this case but i wanted this to just be a step one at least and you guys let me know like i said if you want like a full breakdown story mode i was more interested in talking about like the questions and the issues in this case uh with it being mishandled but there was another crime uh in another area in the country where was it i think it was uh dublin california Uh, and, uh, these cops were doing follow-up because they had a lead on it and they approached this cabin out in the woods. Okay. Ended up going in there, um, and finding all of this stuff. The reason why they ended up finding that cabin is during this home invasion, uh, the, the almost victims attacked this dude. It was the same setup where they heard a noise trying to figure out what it was, had lights in their eyes and lasers like floating. Well, the person, the homeowner attacked him and he fled, dropped his phone. They connected that phone with this cabin. So police went in there and uh, they found go figure wetsuits. They found goggles that had been painted a ton of computer tech a ton of computer tech headphones everything they believe that this is where she was held in this so he had done this to multiple people uh they believe there's more there was more than one person involved in the uh 
in this crime. Well, um, clearly she said there was multiple she people. She heard people arguing, but only one person got charged. A Matthew Muller ended up being arrested in connection with the Dublin home invasion and charged with attempted robbery, burglary, and assault. Uh, he was also indicted on federal kidnapping charges related to the Denise Huskins case. Um, Denise Huskins and Aaron Quinn have filed a lawsuit against the city of Vallejo and its police department, accusing them of defamation and infliction of emotional distress. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. They better win. Oh, at, dude, this is California. They're going to win, and they're probably going to get like $50 million or something ridiculous. Good for them. But uh, what I'm going to do is I am now going to watch this video and see the documentary. How, yeah, how it how it you know pales in comparison to the research I did on reading this. And you guys let me know if you want a deeper dive into the story because the actual kidnapping was interesting. Like in a in a true crime scary way it was interesting that this person or people was so effective that it felt like, you know, CIA, Hollywood, military type uh, operation. operation, and they probably would have got away with it uh, because nobody believed them. And everything they did was top notch, like insane. I can't believe that they had a plan of this magnitude. Assaulting her is probably what ended up getting them caught assaulting her and then fighting and then dropping her off that's what got them caught no 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 that the, the oh. dropping the phone was oh, a different you're situation you're right you're right you're right but no if that phone wasn't dropped there's no way they would have oh caught. yeah you're no. right i forgot i totally blanked all that but you're right if they if that wouldn't have happened especially with these cops these cops did absolutely nothing to help any of this <laughs> it's so absurd they victim blamed it's so stupid and that's what people get attacked for online, victim blaming. And we have our law enforcement doing it for everybody. Yay. I just can't believe they went out to the media like right away and started saying he's the next cop Peterson. That's one of the most absurd things I've ever heard, like ever it's from a so police offensive. department. It's so offensive. Yeah. Without having the evidence to back your claim. You know, yeah, and to think we have cases where they've got it on lockdown, you can't get hardly any information, <laughs> and yeah. then you got other police out here with zero evidence, no arrest, saying, Yeah, he he did something with her, he's the next Scott Peterson. Yeah. We just don't know how yet. Yeah, you know, I, I had one of our viewers that had left a comment that was wondering, it was it the ex girlfriend that targeted them? I don't believe so because the whole reason for that SA that happened, uh, the sexual abuse that happened was because they needed blackmail so that she wouldn't go to police. Right. They didn't understand where the investigation was at and they didn't expect the cops to be such idiots. Why the heck would they consider that blackmail? I would totally still go to the cops. I'd be like, okay. That oh, yeah. Yeah. I, like, yeah. I don't care if you have a video of that. I'm still going to the cops. Oh, no, I'm <laughs> the same way. I I'll I'll play whatever I needed to play to get safe, to, to get, get out physically alive. safe. But I it, it wouldn't stop me either. But who knows what they were thinking? Was that just an excuse to take advantage of her? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, they're the type of people that ki kidnap someone. So you're banking on her being somebody who's even embarrassed by that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in, in Southern California, like, good luck. You know, it's about right. the hippies out there that are not very shy about that. Um, so, yeah, I, I hear you. I think there's mistakes all the way around this. And like I said, I was blown away covering this, you guys. And it goes so much deeper. I could be talking about this for an hour and a half. I don't want to keep everyone too long. So leave your questions, leave your comments, leave your concerns. Let those thoughts riot in the comments below. Let me know uh, if you want this to go deeper. I definitely do. It's crazy. All right.
We are going to be talking about a missing woman. She went missing in Madrid, Spain, um, February 5th of this year. Her name is Anna Knezevich or Knezevic. I am not 100% sure how to pronounce her last name. I've heard it pronounced different ways on different platforms. So um, take your best guess. But anyway, um, she was going through a very bitter divorce um, with her husband. And she went for a holiday um, in Madrid. And the the circumstances around her disappearing disappearance are sketchy like very very sketchy yet the police aren't taking it very seriously uh in spain and her family is very upset and and friends um her brothers come out and talk to the media and one of her friends and um i hate when that happens it, yeah it's absolutely horrible uh, it's just gross. Um, but she, I have her LinkedIn pulled up here and she's got an about me section. That's pretty extensive. Um, she said that she's been in business for like 16 years, um, got her bachelor's in international trade and administration in Colombia. She is originally from Colombia. Um, she, got married and moved to the U S um, and her boy, her, her husband, they started a business from their home and had been running it together up until this divorce. Um, now I believe it was some kind of computer company, uh, computers and applications that need work. I, I believe it had something to do with computers. Hmm. Interesting though. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> she's in Madrid and she, I believe she went there about February 2nd. So she's only a few days into her trip and we have, so apparently she liked to send voice memos instead of text and her friend has given those to news nation. Um, and they played some of them. And one says like, hey, good morning. I woke up, went to the gym, got the apartment ready. I'm going to buy some like cleaning stuff now. I fix my hair, my nails, and I'm just heading back. How are you? I missed you too. Bye. Um, and then there's another message from the day before she went missing. And it says, I saw an apartment that I loved. Yes. So hopefully it will be mine. I'm now on my way to see another one. Everything's going great or doing great. I'm feeling actually really good. I'm going on Monday, Barcelona with a friend of mine. It's just a day trip. She's very excited about it. So see how detailed those are? Yeah. Like she's super detailed, like giving a whole rundown of her day. Which is smart. That's what you should be doing when you're in a place that you don't have family or friends or anything like that. So yeah. Yeah. So um then she sends some texts that are alarming. Um, they're not at all like her normal um, messages that we see. And um, she never shows up to that trip with her friend. She just said she was going to meet a friend in Barcelona. She never shows up. And uh, she sends these texts, which are don't sound like her. So February 2nd, it says, I met someone wonderful. He has a summer house about two hours from Madrid. We're going there now and I will spend a few days there. Signal is spotty. I'll call you when I get back. Yesterday after therapy, I needed a walk and he approached me on the street. Amazing connection like I never had before. Do you feel like that sounds like her? No. Her friend also said like, it's not normal for her to just like go and hook up with somebody random like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, c I can tell right away. I can tell just from the second sentence once he, once they talk about like what he has is that is somebody who is trying to simultaneously boost their ego and uh, has an intention of like controlling a situation. 
That's what I think. Yep. So uh, I summer house and right, right. I agree with you. Um, also, they were written in Spanish. These messages, and uh, she's a native Colombian. Her friend said these messages sounded like somebody who did not speak Spanish who was putting it through Google Translate. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Really weird. Yeah. So um, I would be curious to like mess around with Google Translate and see how it translates, you know? Yeah. I wish I spoke. That would be such an easy thing for cops to verify. You just get somebody who yeah. is native to that area and ask them, you know, does this sound right? You do it with 10 random people and see if they say, yeah, this is not how a local and a native would say this. Right. I feel like that's such an easy verification. I agree with you. Um, but yeah, this this trip, it was a solo trip. Um, she was all by herself. And the fact that she didn't show up to meet her friend and then these texts were alarming. Um, so family members hadn't heard from her. And they started looking for her um, and reported it. And they were e they even put flyers up in in Florida where she had been living. Um, well, News Nation reported that they uncovered security footage from a hotel that shows a man in a helmet spray painting cameras shortly before she disappeared. No. One, um, yeah, look, look, look at that picture in the in the oh, elevator. Man. Is this a trafficking? Oh, another thing is that her that text message where she says she's going to stay with that man for a few days, that would have conflicted with her trip to go visit her friend. She never like said, hey, I'm not going to make it. She didn't say anything. So it doesn't really make sense how she would go off with this man for days and not just like intentionally just not show her up her, for her friend. Yeah, that's obvious. I feel like that is absolutely not her. Nope. It doesn't seem like it's her at all. And the police aren't taking it serious? No. They're not. They don't feel like they're taking it serious. And has what's been reported in the media is that the FBI is involved and local police. Um, and that there's some issue with the police in Florida like there's a language barrier and I'm thinking the FBI is involved. There is no language barrier issue. They can get a translator. I'm sure they have a ton of agents who speak Spanish. Yeah. I, I understand agree. there's dialect differences between Spanish in Spain and Spanish in Mexico and Spanish in Colombia. But it could get, be enough to communicate. It is enough to communicate, yeah, and so they dumb. could easily get somebody who knows the dialect in Spain and somebody who knows the dialect in Colombia. It's not that hard. Yeah. So saying there's communication barrier, that's absurd. Um, that's just ridiculous. So, um, they they added. So the message, when translated, claimed that Anna had met someone in the house with a house about two hours from Madrid, and she was going with them for a few days. They added that there was no phone service where she would be, and she would let her family know when she returned. So at least you know she's not going to be there, right? I that was going to be somewhere else. Yeah. Signal spotty, I'll call you when I get back. Yeah. Weird. I mean, that's that is providing an excuse though for whoever clearly did this. Like, I I had I have no ifs, ands, or buts about it. She was abducted, like yeah. clearly. Yeah. I, I feel like it's not a coincidence that there's a man in a helmet spray painting cameras. Oh, and her husband, after her friend contacted him asking for help looking for her, like literally went off to Serbia. He's originally from Serbia. What? Left Florida. So are they wondering if he has involvement? Yes, they are. Um, 
But here, I have some interesting details around that that I need to pull was, up real quick. Was their divorce going really bad? Yeah, that's what I said. It's a bitter divorce. Like, it's it's really bad. Um, it's really bad. Uh, also, a judge in Madrid denied the re a request from police to search her phone records and apartment. What? Yeah. Because what? they're treating it as a missing persons case, not an abduction. Oh, man. Which is absurd to me. Even if it's a missing persons case, why would you not search her phone records and stuff? I, I don't understand that. Maybe there's a, a different privacy expectation in Spain or something or probable cause it works differently. But that is, just doesn't make sense to me. Um, also, I saw a coffin daffer of all people saying that the FBI could absolutely pull cell phone records for her because if that if the phone they're talking about was registered in America, like she got that cell phone plan in America, which she lives in Florida. She mm -hmm. was there on vacation. Um, that they could obtain cell phone records for her. You don't know? No, I do know. And I, I don't think that's true because. Uh, so can you have a U.S. provider and get coverage worldwide? Yes, it's super expensive, though. So what most people do, because it unlocks the uh, device lock when you go outside of the country is people just buy SIM cards in those other countries. So no, you couldn't reach out to an American company to get cell phone records for a SIM card bought in another country. Mm. No. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh, okay. So she actually arrived in Madrid December 27th. Actually, and went missing around, like, I think she texted that February 2nd and then was reported missing, I think, officially February 5th. Um, but it was actually her friend who's been talking to the media. I don't know. Ramu, Ramue? I don't know. Ramea, Romeu? Something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, R-A-M-E-A-U. Um, that is who she was going to see on February 8th. Um, it was Feb the night of February 2nd, actually, where they saw the man um, spray painting the security cameras. Um, her friend spoke with the person at the front desk of the hotel who told her uh, that that had happened. So um, this man seen in this helmet spray painting cameras is super suspicious, obviously, but on Maybe. top of it, this is known as one of the safest neighborhoods in Madrid. And it's a super nice building. Really? Yeah. So it's like doubly it really suspicious. Stands out. Yeah, it super stands out. Then on February 7th, Anna's brother calls Fort Lauderdale police. Um, and according to this is according to an incident report. He told them that he wanted to talk to his sister's husband, David Kne Knezevich, Knezevich, um, about her disappearance. He told them that David had traveled to Serbia on January 17th. So that's after she's in Madrid. Originally, I thought it was before, mm -hmm. but it's not because now we know she left December not February, which I had must have missed that part when I was reading. But, um, so he didn't know for how long he was going to be there. And when the brother called and texted him asking where his sister was, uh, David replied to him on WhatsApp around 6 PM on February 6 and said he was still out of the country, um, saying she was missing and nothing more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he implied he was still out of the country. But That's we strange. know David was in the country, in town, in Fort Lauderdale at some point between January 7th and 17th and February 6th because on January 25th, 
he reported theft to the police. What? Someone supposedly had stolen $6,000 worth of motorcycle gear, bags, <gasps> and accessories. Motorcycle elect- helmet. Uh-huh. And electronics and cash from his Mercedes Benz, according to another incident report. He met with police that day and said he wanted to press charges. I mean, you have to have a suspect to press charges. Right. Well, the a neighbor said they had seen him, actually, uh, when reporters went down there and said they saw him speaking with police and then never saw him since. Dude. Mm-hmm. And this, unfortunately, is why the case that we just talked about with Aaron... Uh, Aaron Quinn and Denise Huskins happens because statistically it's always yep the significant other and we don't know we genuinely don't know if it's him that's but, very convenient but he's being yeah. suspicious um, so then the brother goes to the apartment the next day uh, knocks on the door nobody answers but there's a bunch of packages stacked up from Amazon at the front door um, and nobody knows where David or Anna, Anna are like, nobody knows. So what we know about their marriage is they were married for 13 years and it was a bitter, bitter, drawn out divorce that was going on. Um, there was a lot of money on the line, apparently because of the business um and properties so they had a real estate business together and owned several properties throughout fort lauderdale mm-hmm. and uh sounding more shady david is also the ceo of an it company called eox solutions and anna also works there They started talking about divorcing last summer. And supposedly they had communicated while she was out of town. Wow. Yeah. It just really doesn't look good. No, it doesn't. Um, People have been... Alleging human trafficking. Um, that was my first thought until yeah. I started hearing those details of missing motorcycle gear and money. Ooh. Yeah. That's convenient. It is convenient. And, you know, her friends come out and said this is so not like her, like meeting a man, going off with him. She doesn't even really drink. Um, she drinks wine here and there. Um they never go out to like clubs or parties. She said they're like a couple of old grannies. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's weird. It's super, super weird. Um, but they have said if, if you have any information at all about her disappearance, disappearance to contact, um, I believe the FBI directly. Uh, let me get the number. It's at the bottom of this. Did I zoom in this far? Gosh, this is like really zoomed in. Jeez. It's It just really sucks because her family are like really concerned and want, you know, more to be done. But it's just like at a standstill because the Spanish government and police are like, she just went missing. Yeah. Like, how can you say that? She just went missing. She's just a missing person. Like, no need to investigate that. Well, I thought the number was at the bottom of this, but I do have a website. Um, I can always put which picture. is um, a tip line, basically, but it's www.policia.es 
slash underscore E-S slash C-O-L-A-B-O-R-A underscore informar info R-M-A-R dot P-H-P. Um, that's what I have so far, far. Or you can contact the FBI because they are also working with the, you know, Spanish government to try to help get her found. Um, yeah. Gosh, I would... I- I just would really not want to go missing out of this country. Like we, you know, we at all, but I yeah. know we obviously scrutinize our law enforcement in this country, but honestly, that's what makes it great. Mm-hmm. That's what makes them do their job and do it. Well, I do believe we have a great system in this country, even if there's flaws, no matter what humans are flawed our system's going to be flawed in some ways, but we can work on it, you know, like yeah. humans always do. Um, but I trust it. And I think it's one of the best in the in the nation. Like for the most part, I trust yeah, it. In the world. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a lot of officers and law enforcement agencies that do incredible work, like incredible. Um, I think the situations where we see issues are usually a one-off, you know, they're not, they're not the majority but to go missing in a foreign country so scary mm-hmm. um but i really hope you know anna's found i really hope her family Thank can you. get answers um and hopefully you know the law enforcement agency over in madrid starts taking this more seriously yeah hopefully the <clears throat> fbi can uh push it along you know look i hope she went missing with some random guy but clearly that's not what happened right clearly clearly is there a sliver of a percent of a possibility maybe um but more than likely not hopefully the fbi is contacting the serbian government too to try to figure out what's going on with david interview him yeah yeah but let me know what you guys think about this um god she's only five foot tall and 80 pounds Mm. wow she's little like on top of it goodness anyway let me know what you guys think about this case um you know eyes and ears out i know we have a lot of foreign listeners um i know in human trafficking in europe all those countries are pretty tightly squished together Um, So anybody who's around the area of Spain, if you see something, say something. Yes. Or in Florida, you know. All right, you guys. So we are diving back in to the 4chan um, frat boy theory. Now, we are not doing it in this case. In this case, this is the prequel, right? The setup for it. Um, Last time we had been talking about it, we went through multiple different videos, covered a whole background of uh, information on why we feel like the, uh, the Greek life could be problematic and why it deserves to be looked into further. We had a lot of good statistics that came out of it. If you guys haven't watched these videos here and it'll catch you up to where we are now, but we started covering some of the deaths in the Moscow area. Well, we are diving back into that. Now we started the furthest back and now we are up, to the closest here so uh i anytime there is a a life lost right uh that needs to be the severity of that situation should be recognized um so i i want to take a minute to before we dive into all the theories and everything um just speak directly from Hudson Lindau's obituary. And that's who we're talking about now. Um, This was a Sigma Chi fraternity brother and unfortunately lost his life the same year that the Idaho four massacre happened. He um, 
died April 30th or May 1st of 2022. So Hudson Lindau, February 13th, 2003 to April 30th, 2022, Boise, Idaho. Hudson R. Lindau was truly one of a kind, born in Boise, Idaho on February 13th, 2003, to uh, his mother and his father. Hudson was a 2021 graduate of uh, Timberline High School. Hudson was a friend and a helper to all whose love and friendship brought people together from all walks of life. People were drawn to Hudson's personality. At home, he was gra- he grounded each household with infectious goofiness. His personal philosophy was to live in the moment and be a better person every day. Hudson's empathy was legendary. He was quick with a smile and a kind word. Hudson passed away on Saturday, April 30th, 2022, on the University of Idaho campus in Moscow, Idaho, where he studied environmental science. His passing at the aptly named Paradise Creek is an enduring reminder of the gift Hudson was to the world. Hudson leaves behind scores of broken-hearted friends, many of whom have held impromptu vigils in his honor, both in Boise and Moscow. Friends and family who have attended these gatherings each carry a unique and personal connection with him. Hudson's gift gift of expressing love came in many forms, from a genuine hug to a smile or even a reassuring look from across the room. Hudson looked forward to traveling the world and experiencing many cultures. He always enjoyed spending time with his best friend and roommate, Kai, who taught him Korean life through his country's language and cuisine while preparing to visit Korea together. He Recently traveled to the Pacific Ocean with friends and was always at peace near the water. Hudson especially enjoyed the time with family. He loved family events where the entire extended family was present. Hudson was an incredible big big brother. He shared an extremely close bond with his sister, Eva, and was adored by his youngest sister, Remy, who loved his silly personality. He was an avid skier and enjoyed close times with his dad. Ava and friends on the slopes. His near daily calls with his mom spoke of the love they shared. Hudson is survived by a whole bunch of family. Uh, he is also by his grandparents uh, and then his paternal grandparents um, that say they will miss him and his unconditional love. Um, a celebration of life will be held on Saturday, June 4th, 2022. So, really sad. Um, what do you know about him? Um, I know that he was friends with Ethan from the Idaho Four, you know, murders. Very and close friends from what we understood. He was good friends with Ethan, and um, he got supposedly really drunk and fell into paradise creek and drowned in like an inch of water yeah correct. or two inches of water right 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 um and i i just i want to run down these ideas with you guys okay i think it's really important and and this is again one of those topics where it's really important how we talk about it right because i want to be respectful but i need to ask the questions um so we're gonna make sure we do it respectfully um there's also an infamous picture of him in front of the 1122 king road house yes there is yes there is absolutely absolutely um but uh Literally an inch of water, you guys. Um, So there's a lot of theories out there. What we know is that, and there's very little to know about this. Do you know that? Yeah. So, uh, and for those of you just catching up, we've tried to get information on this and it is sealed. They do not respond to FOIA requests. They send it straight to their legal department, okay? Okay. Um, so you can't get the police report. You can't get anything. I don't know if it's a time thing and the case is not officially closed, similar to like the Brent Kopaka thing. I I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm still trying to figure that out, but it is insane. If this is an accidental death. I know 
why be so secretive? It makes no sense. And we even have proof here of requests, you know, being made and, and nothing being done the, where the only response is, Hey, uh, I got all your messages, but we sent you to legal. They should have reached out to you and then just dead silence. So, um, we can't get anything. You guys, I don't know if they're, they try and say it's for the respect of the family, because maybe there was more substances in his blood than just alcohol. But one thing that I got a question here, right? is um, we've seen the management of the crime scene at the Idaho for massacre. Um, I tend to feel like that's a reflection of a general work product that we could expect to see in other cases, right? So uh, how do we know that there aren't things being missed here? How do we know that? They yeah. aren't releasing autopsy. They aren't talking about any other marks that were on his body. You guys know the autopsy body layout where they are supposed to identify every single mark, scar, scab, uh, anything. Yeah, they mark any identifying marks whatsoever, any trauma to basically just an outline of a body on the paperwork. So you would think that they would have the model, right? Well. What's the other thing in any investigation? The toxicology report. Mm -hmm. We don't have that either. Hmm. Yeah. Wouldn't that be interesting to find out he was sober? That, that would be interesting to find out. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing we have is uh, a police statement here. Um, that says on on May twenty on May first, twenty twenty two, at approximately eleven twenty eight a.m., the Moscow Police Department received a report of a body found in Paradise Creek near College Avenue. Moscow Police Department officers and detectives arrived on scene and began an investigation. The body had has been positively identified as nineteen year old Hudson R. Lindau of Boise, Idaho. At this time. Foul play is not suspected. Next of kin has been notified and the investigation is ongoing. That's May 1st. Foul play is not suspected. And what's the date he died? May 1st. Oh. Yeah. On day one, day one, they're saying no foul play. So could an investigation even happen at this point? Like, could you even make that assertion, especially considering it's literally the morning you found him? Right. Or did the storyline that best fit... The community and college get rolled out, and that's what we stuck to. And that reminds me of something. That reminds me of the police coming out after the Idaho Four <clears throat> murders <clears throat> saying, don't worry, it was targeted. You guys are not at risk. All good here. The public's right. not at risk and then quickly walked that back when they started being questioned because they're like, right. Well, yeah, we don't have a suspect. We don't know who did it. So I guess technically you should be on the lookout. <laughs> right. Exactly. Stay vigilant. So to me, this sounds like they're responding for whatever works best for the school and community, not from a police perspective. To keep the community physically safe. Well, right. It's not for the community. It's for the school. It's for, it's what's it's for best monetary for the school. gains is what it feels like, right? I don't, I don't have evidence of that. I think this is good evidence towards creating a potential theory or hypothesis goal. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, there's... It's depressing. Like, there's no way that these police officers could have known. Within the first 12 hours, they came out and said that, uh, you know, it, 
it's not suspected. Foul play is not suspected. Yeah, it's absurd. I'm curious what happened leading up to that. Was the coroner involved? Did they talk to anybody? Kathy Mabbitt was the coroner. She yeah, but when that statement was put out. Oh, right. Did they had what they happened even... before this statement to give them the uh okay to to roll this out? What time was Hudson found? Like what, what time 11 was 30? What time was the call? Um I mean they they got there at 11:30, 11 28. Huh. Yeah. And what time did they release that statement? Does it say the date and time? Um, the it bottom. doesn't show the time. Okay. But the date, yeah, it's it's the date of the crime. So crazy. Yeah. It is. It is. So where this really started getting a lot of attention and drawing a connection here is uh, with a post that was posted to Twitter. And the post read, I have questions. Moscow LE law enforcement has been running with this whole nothing like this has ever happened here narrative. So does anyone care to explain this? U of I student H Hudson Lindau was found dead in Paradise Creek on 5 1 of 2022. You read that right. Another student from U of I died earlier this year. And he's not the only one. Right. You're right. Yeah. Context. On 4-30-2022, the night before, Delta Tau Delta held its 90th annual uh, ball where Xana, Maddie, Jake, uh, and JS were... Showalter. Yep. Yeah were all in attendance. Hudson's body was found the next morning in the creek right outside Greek Row. Hudson's death was immediately ruled an accidental drowning. Crazy, right? This post further read, could this mean literally nothing? Or could mean literally nothing, but, he, but also here's a picture of Hudson's out here's a picture of Hudson outside the girl's house and a map to see where his body was found in relation to the frats and sororities. One of Hudson's friends blurred out in the photo is Delta Tau Delta's president. The same frat uh, Showalter was supposedly kicked out of and riddle me this. Where was, where are all the stories on this investigation? Police immediately said there was no foul play upon finding his body. How? What led to him ending up in the creek that night? Everyone was just like, oh, he drowned and moved on. The, the post at last read, not trying to create conspiracy theories here, but for a small town, uh, there sure are some crazy coincidences. I, I make it make sense. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Make it make sense. I agree with that. And we're, these are, this is why we're asking these questions here, right? Because uh, in this video, in these few videos that we posted, we had some very big questions and community based questions around the fraternities. Um, you know, it, it, is fraternity life feeding? unhealthy behaviors in a way where it's creating uh you know frat brothers that are more likely to end up in situations like this because when you look at the national stats it feels that way it does so there there have been i'm not going to use the word conspiracy theories but there have been people questioning whether the Idaho 4 crime had something to do with this did these four I've questioned it myself. Yeah. Did these four know something? Was Ethan unhappy with this current story? Was Ethan uh, was he able to find out more information? Is there really more to this? Yeah, as soon as I found out that Ethan was friends with Hudson like 
pretty good friends with him and they were both in Sigma Chi um, <clears throat> in that there was a fight at Sigma Chi that night. Um, I immediately started questioning that, you know, at, at face value, everyone's like, well, the fight at Sigma Chi, like it was about, you know, Xana and he was made fun of like this roid rage guy is not going to freak out over a girl and somebody saying, you know, he's on steroids, which we're covering um, next, but yes. Yeah. And, and go like commit this nearly perfect crime is what they always say. But what if it's not nearly perfect? What if the investigators were so inept, they just completely overlooked DNA and evidence right. or corrupted it in some way to where it couldn't be used? Like, we have three other males' DNA there. And right, these but- are friends and close in close vicinity. What if they're like, okay, well, we cleared those people because they were sleeping. Um, and their other frat brother says they were sleeping. So, Right. I- I don't want to focus on that. Um, I want to stay focused on this because we're going to talk about that in the next story. So, okay. <laughs> um, because yes, I agree with you. However, I think that the evidence that we're seeing based on this crime here is supporting the additional evidence to the misclassification of the case. Actually, we don't even know if it's a misclassification. We have no idea. They slapped a sticker on it and committed to that, even when they got called out for it and and had to backtrack, but then came out with uh, a statement saying, well, actually, we do think it's this and we think it's this, you know, um, and and it was it was done in a really shady way. And it felt very similar to this where Somebody lost their life here, okay? It's not only just losing their life. They very quickly ruled it an accidental drowning. Then on top of that, they have made the police paperwork, which is public accessible, right? By law, we are supposed to be able to receive access to these documents, and nobody can. Everybody is stonewalled. I've been asking around trying to find, hey, have you seen anybody that's been able to get this? Have you seen anybody that's been able to get this? We've tried to get it and nobody can get it. Nobody. It's impossible. All right. So help me understand that. If this is just an accidental drowning, then what is the secrecy around this? Yeah. If it's an accidental drowning, there is no need to hide an autopsy report. There is no need to hide a toxicology report. There is no need to be so secretive. I mean, why, if there's so many theories and rumors going around and it really is just an accidental drowning, why not settle the rumors and show some proof? It doesn't make it's sense. It's absurd. It's absurd, I, I which I think immediately indicates they're hiding something. I mean, is that not the next logical step here? I feel like that's a, a fair assumption. Absolutely. So, you know, if anybody from that area watches this, I, I, I don't see how you could watch this and like see these details and not understand how uh, people are at like begging the question of what is going on here. What is going on here other than not following the laws and the expected rules, regulations of our justice system nationally, not giving the general public the access to this report, these reports, which are our rights, uh, unless there's an open investigation, unless, you know, there's some reasons why we wouldn't get them. None of that's going on here. If this has been ruled an accidental drowning case closed, right? Moved on. Uh, and and people are asking these questions. Yeah. Why? If, if case is closed, there's no reason to continue not giving the reports. And if I were living in Moscow, Idaho, I would be a very concerned citizen and I wouldn't feel very safe. Right. And and who out of the four was interested in true crime? Kaylee. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Maybe she went looking for answers. Maybe, maybe I'm not sure, but I know that I feel like this hasn't got enough of positive attention. Right. And we're just asking the questions. I thought right. Podcast is not here to answer the questions. We'll give information, you know, the scientific background and everything where we have it. 
Um, but I don't think we can answer these questions. This is yet again another puzzle that we are not given the tools that we need to solve it and understand it. And we don't even understand why. Yeah. I mean, the police should have solved it. The police should have looked into it and they should have given that information to the public. Like that's how these things are supposed to work. I'm curious if Hudson's family have received the autopsy report, if they've received anything. Well, yeah, I, I get where you're going with that statement. I don't think that the public should just trust in the police's report, though. I am against that type of behavior. I, I don't think we should trust a police investigation. Um, I think it's important to draw our own conclusions by being uh, critical, you know? Yeah, I, I think we should obviously scrutinize, scrutinize their, their work, critique their work, pay attention to what's going on. It is that is how this is supposed to work in America. That's the constitutional. That's the basis of our constitution and our country is being able to do that um, because the people are supposed to run the country. Anyone who's in yeah. government is supposed to be in service to us. Um, and if if you argue against that, I mean, I don't understand that. It's like the American way, just that's how it's supposed to be. Um, but it seems like they want to avoid, it just seems they want to avoid that. Like pretend scrutiny. these things aren't happening, right? So it does seem like they want to pretend they're not happening. Play, let's play flip the coin here, right? And we'll, we'll look at it from a good faith, full trust perspective. Uh, I can only assume that this is being done in a way where they're trying to control the media narrative. Hmm. And one, one suggestion it's, it's not a suggestion. One fact is you're failing horribly failing at that. This information is getting out there. Right. And I, I, I just have a hard time understanding that because are they looking at this like, Oh my gosh, we have, a dead body that is such a bad reflection on us and it's not i mean people die that's part of having uh, a civilization you know there are going to be situations where unfortunately uh life is lost in in unexplainable circumstances right um yeah it's going to be there's going to be freak accidents there's going to be really you know Horrible situations that seem to have happened for no reason, but they still happened. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily reflect bad on the university, but that's what makes me question, did this specific death reflect bad on the university? And that's why we don't have any answers. We know Scott Green was president at the time of this murder or not murder, uh, <laughs> accidental drowning. Yeah. Um we know that he has said that a school is only as good as their big, their biggest headlines, you know, or worst headlines. My bad. You're only mm -hmm. as good as your worst headlines or something like that. Um, and he was already coming into being a president from really bad headlines, horrible headlines, and was trying to secure this University of Phoenix deal, which was being heavily scrutinized. He was literally investigated. For it because of the issues surrounding that. Yeah. Um, he had a like a meeting or something that was like not supposed to happen off the record. Um, but we know I mean, all of these things were reaching out and saying, hey, you need to back out of this. Like the attorney general tried to file a lawsuit on him. Well, it's because he wasn't listening to any of them there. What I assume that is, and I don't want to get too far off topic here, is I assume they were in good faith reaching out to him and saying, hey, you need to stop. I can't tell you there is a federal investigation into this college, but there's a federal investigation into this college. <laughs> and you're putting at risk everything by continuing this back off, you yeah. know? I know. And then he comes out of the book like he's the best president ever to exist right. of a university. Right. So, um, and he's got all the good advice. So I just, it makes me wonder if this has more to do with the reflection on the university than it does anything. I mean, we know that he was consulted on the Idaho four case daily, daily briefings with the police. 
Um, unacceptable. Yeah, absolutely unacceptable. And I assume it was a very si- similar situation here. Yeah, it seems like this got swept under the rug very quickly, unfortunately, because, uh, you know, it. every single human life out there uh, should be appreciated. And even in a really unfortunate situation like this, like, uh, I still think it's important to remember people. Um, you know, it, it sounds like the school did not have a vigil for him. It sounds like based off what uh, was said in here, the parents said, you know, his friends had impromptu. Uh, yeah. Impromptu vigils and, and whatnot for him. Um, so I can only assume it's because there was not an official one. I thought there um, was. I mean, maybe there was. I need to go back and look where where I was digging because I see problems here is I was trying to find the 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 legal documents, the police records, mm. trying to find anybody that has came across this. Had they ever come forward and said, hey, here you go. Why are people sent to their legal department? Yeah. Why? Hmm. I don't understand it. No, I can't find anything about a a vigil that the university did for him. The only real response is from Moscow Police Department. You should have received a response from the city of Moscow legal department. If you have any questions about the information provided, please contact them at number provided. Hmm. So there isn't a whole lot of juicy information to bring here, but is that juicy information that there is none? You know what I mean? Yeah. It it makes me ask these questions. Was there really a connection? Was this a continuation of, uh, you know, some kind of disagreement? Was he there? At that party, that 90th annual whatever party, where where is it? Um, was he there with the Idaho Four? Hmm. I don't know. These are questions that I would like to know. I don't know either. I mean, it's such an odd situation. It really is so weird. And like to have a student die and to give no answers. And that it, it that's was the insane. Delta Delta Tau Delta 90th annual. Uh, where'd it go? This website. Ball or something, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah, that site is like freaking out. Yeah, it's being weird. It looks like they did have a celebration of life for him, but I'm not 100% sure what that exactly means. It looks like his mom set up like, um, they listened to his favorite hip hop artist, ate cub, cup pop, bop, cup pop, wait, cup bop. Hundreds of attendees celebrated Hudson's life, uh, lingering till the very end of the memorial. Mm. But I don't, 100% know where this was. Um, This was reported by the UIA. Oh, wait, UI Argonaut. So I think it is a U of I uh, newspaper or something like that. Okay. Well, I hope so. Like I said, if if there's any information I don't know, it's going to be that. I I didn't put a lot of time into researching that specifically because I I want to know the details of the situation of yep. how he was found. I would yep. like to know the police report. Uh, I would like to have the autopsy. I would like to have the toxicology. Um, you know, are we going to get the, uh, are we going to get the autopsy and find that it was like, um, I'm drawing a blank. Who's the other one under the bridge? Um, oh, oh yeah. Um, gosh. <laughs> Yeah. Joseph Y. Derrick. Joseph Y. Derrick had an injury to the back of his head uh, found frozen under a bridge. Um, Are we going to find out that Hudson Lindau had uh, an injury to the back of the head and, you know, 
drown in an undrownable lake, river, creek. It was a creek. Creek. It was a trickle of a creek. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious what you guys think about it. This is really just a prequel to get ready uh, for the conversation next. So um, let those thoughts riot in the comments below. Let me know if you have any additional information. Uh, let me know if you've been stonewalled trying to get this information. How many people have reached out? And, uh, you know, is there any kind of statement? Should we push harder? Let me know. Yeah, I think so. I think there needs to be answers. I was thinking about the whole timeline of after Brian Koberger supposedly left the Idaho for, you know, 1122 King Road home and the route that we were talking about this last week, um, the cell phone towers and you were showing the gaps in coverage. Yeah. Um, looking at that map, I was like really curious what roads are these that they're showing because there's no names of roads on the map um, that Brett Payne provided in Exhibit A Statement of Brett Payne, the probable cause affidavit for this case. Um, there's no road names. And another thing that's weird to me um, is that they have like, is that blue thing supposed to be a tower or yep. is that it is? I think so. Yes, I do. So where's the King Road home then? Right in that area. Okay, because they don't show, like, they give this a very general outline of a route, but they don't show, like, this isn't actually the route. It isn't. Because when I pull up that route, okay, and taking the information provided in the PCA, um, it says exactly that after he left the house, he... Exited, he exited the neighborhood via Walenta Drive, okay? So if you're leaving the home, you would go straight down Queen Road, and hopefully there, it'll be up here on the screen for you guys. But if you're an audio listener, I'll, I'll tell you the street names. Um, so you would, you would be going down Queen Road, then you would take a right on King Road, a left on Walenta, make this little loop around, um, and then kind of make a left turn to stay on Walenta. And then you would turn right on Sunny Side Avenue and then make another right on Conestoga Street, which is also in the PCA. They say he leaves mm -hmm. via Luenta and goes uh, Walenta and then goes to Con Conestoga Street. And you would follow that around till you get to Palouse River Drive. And then from Palouse River Drive, you would turn right on Main Street. Main Street turns into I-95, okay. which heads straight down, just like we see in that picture. It shows going straight down, um, and that's headed towards, like, the, uh, the Clarkston, Lewiston area. Mm. But in this map, he didn't go all the way to Clarkston, Lewiston area that night. Um, he ends up making a right hand turn on a little road. And what I think it is, cause I was looking at the shape of the roads in that area and trying to make it look as close as possible to the map that they're showing here. Okay. So what I think it is, is what's, it's a little road called Borgen road. And mm -hmm. it passes this place called the Historic Cam Cambish Family Century Farm, which is closed right now. Um, and then he would turn on a road called Thorn Creek Road and go down to a town called Union Town, where he would turn right onto 195. Okay. And that is when he would start going north towards Pullman. And once he starts going north towards Pullman, he would come to a little town ca called, uh, I think, yeah, Colton. Um, keep following 
195 up until he gets to Chambers and then he gets off on Staley Road, which mm-hmm. passes an airport called Staley Airport. Okay. And then he would follow that road around to Johnson Road. And this is where it begins to line back up with the actual statements in the PCA because he would follow Johnson Road all the way up through Bug Busby into Pullman. And because Johnson Road goes all the way into Pullman, like you are you take it all the way in until you get to um, East Main Street. And then he would take uh, Northeast Stadium Way uh, and then turn on Northeast Orchard Drive and then Northeast Valley Road and then Northeast Merman Drive to Garden Avenue. And he would turn into the Steptoe Apartments. Interesting. I didn't realize those side streets. I wonder if during editing, I'll I'll put an overlay of two maps. Well, I have these maps here, and I I have I have the route. I saved it in maps and sent you the whole thing because I oh, okay. mapped the whole thing out. Awesome. Um, and I was gonna take a screen recording so you could attach it to of going through it, but maybe we could just do screenshots. I don't know. We'll hmm. we'll see. Um, but. It's interesting because they allege that this route would have made him avoid cameras. Really? That's what they say. But he didn't. He got caught on cameras. Yeah. Where Where does it say that? that it says that in the PCA that they believe he took this route to avoid cameras. Oh, CCTV okay. that this route would avoid cameras, but it doesn't. He got caught on cameras going out of the neighborhood or out of, yeah, out of the neighborhood on. He literally went to Main Street in both towns where you are caught on cameras. <laughs> also, I think that's good. Jeez, that's good evidence. Cause, also, yeah. Yeah. Also, it's an hour. So this exact route is an hour and eight minutes. At least that's what my maps is saying. Okay. An hour and eight minutes literally lines up perfectly for him taking that route and making no stops at all. Okay. With the PCA timeline. Perfectly. Perfectly. Yeah. So no stops, an hour eight. So he arrived home at 5.30 a.m. And he left at 4.20. An hour and eight minutes. Mm. An an hour and 10 minutes. Rounded up to an hour and 10 minutes. Okay? Like, that's literally a two-minute difference. He would have had to make literally like a two-minute stop. But anything could have happened. It was winter. There was snow. Like... Yeah. It is literally on the dot perfect. So so there's not much time to hide evidence. No, unless he's literally driving down the road chucking stuff out the window. No, he didn't have time to go bury a hole. No way. Unless this is what came to mind after I figured that out. I was like, okay. They're saying he, they know he left the home at 420 and they know based off camera footage, he arrived home at 530 in Pullman. And that, like I said, this exact route, which you guys are going to see the map that I routed, it is to the T perfect. An hour and eight minutes, an hour and 10 minutes is what they're saying. So unless we're going to say Brian Koberger is like the flash and can hide evidence and bury a hole in literally two minutes after murdering four people brutally with one of the most horrific bloody crime scenes there could be, you know, and get home and leave no blood in the car, no blood in his apartment. I don't, I don't understand how that's not super significant to everyone because they then say, 
despite being home at 5.30, okay, in the morning, that he must have not slept, you guys, because he left at 9 a.m. the next morning. He was only home for three and a half hours, so he had to get rid of all of that blood evidence in three and a half hours. Three and a half hours and then leave house and be gone all day long. And didn't sleep. A wink. Not a wink. Strange. And then he goes back down to what we know, okay, from the PCA. He supposedly went to Albertsons. And then when he's driving back up up home, they say his phone turns off around Johnson, Washington. And it's off. Supposedly, it's off to like 8.30 p.m. for like three hours. Okay. And then he's back up in Pullman. So strange. I just, they better have good video footage and cameras, CCTV. I mean, they have, that's why I'm wondering if they made such, because we all know the most detailed part of the PCA is literally him at Albertsons. Yeah. And Kate's cup of Joe coffee stand. It is. That is the most detailed and actually showing what they have. Okay. We have this and this cell phone tower and video footage of him doing this. It is the most detailed and backed up with evidence part of the PCA. Hands mm -hmm. down. Hands down. Um, did they make such a big deal of that? Because they knew it wasn't possible for him to get rid of evidence during that time. So they're trying to say he did it on his way to Albertsons and back. Like that's the important time frame. But we got to remember that he still didn't leave any evidence in the car or the home, his apartment. Mm -hmm. Now the no shower curtain, I actually can see why that's kind of damning. If we're talking, because if I if I committed a crime like that and then I went and showered at home, I would get rid of my shower curtain and bleach the entire bathroom. A shower curtain would definitely have evidence on it after rinsing a bunch of blood off of you and cleaning everything in there. Yeah. Are they thinking he took all that stuff home, wrapped it in his shower curtain after taking a shower, and then went and buried it somewhere after going to Albertsons? I want to know what he bought at Albertsons. Does Albertsons even carry a shovel? I don't know. But isn't isn't the current story that he bought cleaning supplies? No, we don't know what he bought. People okay. say stuff like that, but we don't know what he bought. They didn't say what he bought. Hmm. that's what people want to believe yeah but um yeah we don't we really don't know that um yeah i just I, this timeline is so tight it is so incredibly tight until the, until the next day after he goes to Albertsons. And it makes you question, like, okay, when they lost him on the cell phone towers, um, at, at like, I think it was like 5-something p.m., 5.30 p.m. till 8.30, was it him just literally losing service or his phone dying? Gosh, that's such a hard one because we know that the he's service trained sucks. in yeah. uh in 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 technology in cloud-based forensics in uh in uh cell phone related forensics mm -hmm. and he would know better. He would and or should know better. So it makes it so hard that they're leaning on that, right? 
It it does make it hard because if he's so well trained in it, then you would know that turning your phone off between Johnson, Idaho or Johnson, Washington and Pullman and then just being in Pullman, it, they're going to think it's in between the area of Johnson, Washington and Pullman in that area. And they're going to go look there immediately. Which they should. I, I think they should. There's they no indication that they him. have. There's no indication that they have looked there. Yeah, it's it's strange and it's interesting and it makes me need to understand why. Mhm. Mm I need to understand why. Um you know, it, what's that type of investigation called again? I always I can never remember the name of it uh that you covered. Which one? The uh starts with a C. Wait, where did it take place? Um, we did a video on it. Okay, we've done a lot of videos on yeah, all of this. I, I understand that, but you did a video on it that talks about a an investigation, a secret investigation. Parallel construction. Parallel construction, yep, investigation. Um, it makes me wonder immediately if that is what we're seeing here, and that's what the PCA is about, because... Uh, they they felt like they had to catch this guy, right? And I'm playing the Coburger's guilty side of the equation right now. But did they use tools without any regard to public data control and public safety of information uh, and figure out he did it, but now can't be honest about it? You know? Mm-hmm. The shower curtain doesn't weird me out because shower curtains are gross in general. And if he is a clean freak, I, I, I don't feel weird about him taking his shower curtain and either throwing it away or taking it out uh, while he's leaving. He was leaving for a couple weeks. I understand that. And I agree with you. I think that it can go either way. A hundred percent. I think it could go either way. Um, it's really, it's not a strong indicator of anything really for me because it could go either way, but I could see the argument for oh, yeah. it being for a bad reason, you know? Um, but yeah, he, he supposedly leaves at 9 a.m., goes back to the King Road residence, apparently. Um, and then at like noon, he's at Kate's Cup of Joe coffee stand. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. Um, I mean, after that little asleep, I would probably need some coffee too. Yeah, probably. But most people drink coffee every day. And once you start, you can't yeah. just stop or no, else you sure. get a headache. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, to be honest, it, that little of sleep is not that big of a deal. It, I'm more curious when... He went to sleep. Did he go to sleep at 7 p.m. and then wake up and not be able to sleep through the rest of the night at like 10 p.m.? You know, uh, yeah, um, I want to know what he was doing the day before the crime. That's yeah. really interesting information for me personally. Yeah, me but too. it's not talked about whatsoever. Um, but yeah, it says between. Additional analysis of the phone um, indicated that between approximately 5.32 and 5.36 p.m., um, it was utilizing cellular resources that provided coverage to Johnson, Idaho. Um, the phone then stops reporting to the network from approximately 5.36 to 8.30 p.m. Um, it's consistent with the 8458 phone being in the area that the 8458 phone traveled in the hours immediately following the suspected time the homicides occur occurred. So basically what they're saying is he traveled this area just way early in the wee hours after the crime and then his phone gets turned off the next day for three hours in that same area. But again, that timeline is so tight from the early wee morning morning hours. Yeah. That it's like it doesn't even matter. He literally yeah. would have to stop for like 
a minute. Yeah. The, and plant something somewhere and then come back the next day. I, I think the only way to be able to do it would be like in a body of water with some kind of weight. Mm. Which there in is passing like there you know. is Snake River in the Lewis and Clarkston area. Yeah. So people have been talking about that. I mean, you know, yeah. Crime Circus was of like, course. let's go magnet fishing out there. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is uh, speculation that could go both ways. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I I just know <clears throat> that I don't believe. But it's the not Johnson, Idaho. Storyline. It's Washington. Johnson, Washington, by that, the way. That's what I know is I do not believe the current storyline. Do I do I think it could be a completely separate story and uh, the police based off a lazy investigation that we've seen, some mistakes that we've seen, maybe some bad choices in the way that wording was done and everything. Um, is that an indicator that uh, you know, it, there are some lazy aspects to this investigation and, and trying to put it on him in this way uh, is just them not doing a full investigation up front, honest, well, checking everything? I, you, I don't know. You I, know, you know, what's interesting is my question immediately after they say that the phone turned back on at 830 or started reporting to the network at 830 p.m. It doesn't say where he is at 830 p.m. You know. You know that they have his phone. Um, that's one area of the PCA that makes sense, right? Where they say that his phone stopped reporting to the network. They're right in doing that, okay? But what's interesting is once they arrested him and got his phone, they'll be able to tell you for sure if he turned it off or not. You can get a list of the commands made at those times. So hmm. they'll be able to know if he powered off or if it disconnected. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. But in the same respect, how much does it matter if he did turn it off? It doesn't. I. It'll just add to the story uh, in the PCA that, um, you know. He turned it off to avoid detection. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Hmm. So, uh, no, I think this is really interesting. I didn't realize that based on the PCA's own time frame, he didn't have any time to stop. None. He had no time to hide evidence or clean up anything. So, so this until idea he got home, like that's why Blaker said that, that he went immediately home and there has to be blood in that house. So, because he had no time to do anything else. So this idea that he drove away from 1122 and parked at the river and washed off in the river is not possible. It's not. Okay. Not with this route that they're alleging, which who knows how accurate it is considering there's no the camera footage and the cell phone towers are weak evidence. Yep. 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 Who Absolutely. knows? Absolutely. All I know is that they say he went down that area, and if he did, it is like over an hour drive, and he got home an hour later after that time that they claim he was speeding out of the neighborhood. That's good. I don't know. I Based off this information, I'd be super curious to hear what you guys think about it. Um my head is honestly still kind of spinning. I'm not 100% sure what I think about it. I just know that if Brian Koberger is guilty of this crime, he's Houdini. Like, he had no time to clean up. And he passed nothing to the car or his apartment, which is literally an act of magic. Yeah. Sorcery. So so playing the Brian Koberger's guilty card here... Um it could be both things. It could be that the cops did a really bad job and he knew what he was doing, which is going to make things 10 times worse, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. But let me know what you guys think in the comments, theories, suggestions, 
Anything to add to this? Definitely let me know. It's interesting. All right, you guys, we are diving back in. Finally, this is uh, back into the the frat boy 4chan theory that uh, is a review, essentially. Um, last time we covered this, we had half the subs that we currently have. So I feel like there's quite a few people on here that might not know a lot about it. Maybe they do. Hmm. I, I don't know, but I thought it's a good time for us as a whole to go back through it and kind of start from there, you know? Um, so what do you think of the 4chan frat boy theory? Um, I feel like it's a plausible theory. Yeah, I do too. And I, I think too. it could have happened without anybody trying to frame Brian Koberger. I think that the argument against the 4chan theory is that um, f there's no way because then either these frat boys would have had to have gone out of their way and randomly pick Brian Koberger for who knows what reason, like it doesn't make sense um, and, and try to frame him or the cops picked him. And again, why Brian Koberger? And it just, that's what the argument is against it is like for the, I don't agree. I don't think it means that somebody had to pick Brian Koberger and try to frame him for this to be true. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I also think that it's important to note here that as we're going through this, um, this could be set up in a whole bunch of different ways too. It, it could be Brian Koberger's involved in some way with uh, these people. He could be a lookout. He could not be involved at all and be completely separate. I think it could go a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think that him being involved with these uh, frat boys is the least likely scenario based off of his personality. Um, but I, I just, I don't see that really, but, um, I think that Brian Kober could essentially be, if this were, you know, in a universe where it's like true, um, he could be a victim of circumstance, like was literally out driving that night. Yeah. I, I think that's a, a realistic possibility too. Um, and that's the whole reason we are digging into the investigation at all is to find out what we believe the likelihood is of these things happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. So those of you watching, if you have not watched our first 4chan frat boy theory videos, you really should watch those. Um, it gives a full layout going into the statistical evidence around the Greek life, uh, how dangerous the Greek life is. Mm -hmm. It goes into the statistics around, uh, it, it's so clear. It's one in two. So almost 50% of fraternity brothers leave college and the Greek life at the end of, you know, getting their degree and have an addiction or alcoholism problem. I mean, yeah, one of the uh, presidents of um, a fraternity chapter there in Moscow literally died after leaving. He was a president. Yeah. He died of an overdose. Yeah. Twice, actually, because he went to the ER and then went out and uh, like officially died. Yeah. And wasn't be able, he wasn't able to be brought back. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so this is clearly that, this is clearly a, a subject close to that town. Like, yep, they party. No, absolutely. they do. They absolutely party. And uh, another important factor is uh, that women uh, in sororities, one in three are assaulted during their time. We like, also have an SA case from that town. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So. Um, I think all those stats are really important when you're taking into consideration the background likelihood of something like this happening, right? Because I think the easy, uh, the easy go to here is like, there's no way these kids could have done it. These are just a, a bunch of young, drunk, 
acting dumb kids, right? Yeah, like they're all idiots. Yeah, yeah. And just partying and have no care or concern for something like that. And and the statistics say otherwise. So um, make sure you guys check them out. But we'll get right into this here. And I think there is some very interesting evidence. I want to get through like what this is. I guess we can go through it piece by piece. But uh, okay, the background into the the 4chan frat boy theory around well starting december 11th of 2022 4chan started having these posts come up right and for those of you that are new 4chan is a relatively anonymous platform i mean you can go in there uh and post anonymously uh and it gives you a uh a number an id code uh that that's generated for that login time or you can have a profile you can do either or uh well somebody hopped on there on 12 11 and started talking about this crime so december 11th is when nobody knew about Brian Koberger. Nobody had any details. There was no PCA out. There was no real information out other than the uh, fact that they were looking for a knife sheath. Mm -hmm. Interesting. No details about how the victims were found. No details about the actual crime scene and, other than college students that might have seen it during that morning fiasco. Right. And and we knew they were looking for a K-bar knife. The sheath was only speculation, but it was being heavily speculated around the Internet because they were looking for that specific, very specific knife. Um, you know, Papa Rogers and also many other people were saying, well, maybe they left like a sheath of some kind. Because when you look up K-Bar, it comes with a sheath. And it's like, well, why that knife? Well, did the person leave behind a sheath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, these posts have been a major point of contention for uh, people that believe Brian Koberger is guilty uh, and people that believe Brian Koberger is innocent. People that believe he's guilty, uh, a lot of them believe this is Brian Koberger on here. Um, and uh, it, it, in my opinion, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Do I think that it, all of these things are possible? Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think Brian Koberger's writing this, and we'll get into why i i absolutely do not think it's brian koberger writing it and you know we've had people like content creators that that believe koberger is guilty that think he wrote this because there's so many intimate details that it's like not possible yep. for somebody who wasn't really close to this crime to have written this it isn't possible mm -hmm. they knew things way before the pca Yep. Like literally over 20 days, like mm -hmm. 20 days, almost exactly before the PCA. And we had as a public literally had nothing. Yep. We had nothing. We had scraps. We didn't even know what floor Dylan was on um, or did we? Yeah. But um, it, it's interesting. And my argument against it being Brian Koberger is that you would have to know intimate relationship details of how these sororities, fraternities, and people connected with this crime, how they interacted, how they knew each other, like so many intimate details that you would have to spend a long time stalking their social medias and being in close vicinity to them and at yep. parties to know. I agree. I agree. So we'll kick it off here. And, and for those of you watching too, um, I'm going to change words that I don't feel like are appropriate to have on here. Just so you know, it's not going to change uh, the content or anything like that. I'm just going to leave out some mm -hmm. words. And then another thing is I'm, I'm not going to use last names. I'm going to use first names. Uh, it, it's a pair of Davids and these, this has been presented all over the internet. Otherwise, I do not like putting people's names out there, but uh, they are already out there and you can very easily find yes. who they are if you're curious. So, yeah. Um, 
and all their social media is locked down and everything. So there's nothing you can find. And that's another big piece of evidence here. So starting on December 11th of 2022, this was at what? So, uh, seven, six, 15 PM, uh, a plus in poli side two, three, five, your Catholic homeboy, David two, playing white, super lame, and is the alibi for his boyfriend, David One. Uh, David One killed all of them while David Two stood by in the area. Lacrosse and wrestling for David One with his K-bar. That knife is in Garden City, planned and talked about it in high school uh, at Bishop Kelly. Absolute jerks. 20 years. Check David Two's Twitter. Um, is what he is not funny, pathetic. So apparently, okay. And I can't find this picture. So if anybody has it, David too posted something on his Twitter showing them, uh, like in masks from that night. Hmm. Interesting, right? Yeah. So these are in order here, you guys, too. So um, so next we have Monday, December 12th of 2022, and this is at 4.50 p.m. I wonder if, if David 1 realizes David 2 is going to turn on him. Think about how weak David 2 is to be led by David 1. If police interrogate him, it's over. He'll cut a deal because he didn't actually commit the crimes. He stood guard, and he's weak-minded and easily influenced. Plus, his family has all the money. He's the one from uh, uh, an important family from the area, and he'll get a good lawyer. I didn't include that last time, uh, but I thought it was interesting, right? It gives you a little bit of background. You skipped the bottom sentence. These guys are. Does David one think he has a chance? Mm. Um, this met okay. So this is December twelfth, and at uh, six fifty four, so seven p.m. This message to shriveled um, testes, David one and his um, B David two. We know you did it. It's only a matter of time. Remember those photos you took in your masks the night of and the photos of David one one's bandaged hand the days after the event. The photos peeping into the house from the outside windows. You really thought you could those could be deleted. All the apps you I don't want to say that word. Um R word zoomers have on your Phones have access to your photos and data. Law enforcement is obtaining them in these various tech companies now. You were really dumb enough to log this evidence on your phone while they had while you have TikTok on your phone. It'll be your downfall. Zoomer scum. Then it has uh set so this is December David. One and David two did this absolute jerks. Uh, David two has a crap video feed. Um, and did you know David two like that? That poli sci is because David two um, tutored Ethan. Did you know that? Oh, wild, right? In poli sci, yep, specifically. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, gosh. Yep. So more of a connection. He says, uh, bruh, David 1 did end them, and David 2 was the alibi on standby. Thriller kill. Sick dudes. Watch homeboys tutor vids for no excuses. Homeboy an absolute uh, dork and joined a frat because he could never get a spray tan. So they're just talking trash. Let me... I'm going to go to... I mean, all of it's talking trash. Yeah, yeah. But I want to go to the important one. Okay, right here, you guys. This this is the important one. Um, So, December 22nd. December 12th, 2022. Bruh, you can see the King Road from David One's room. 
Once that third floor light turned off, they did it. 19 minutes total, walk included. Talked about this at uh, high school and um, Sigma Chi. David won and Ethan, which called E, got into a fight that night. Allegedly talking trash, uh, David won had problems with, with Mads also. This crap's been brewing since fall rush last year. Uh, they went quiet on SM for two weeks before and after the deed. David two's mom's a paralegal, so he knows not to say anything. David one cleared his social media. Um, had to take a crap. SX 22. Saw Ethan X and David two and David one at the party. David two, David one and Ethan had issues back to Ethan rushing. Ethan talked trash about David one taking roids and having his uh, balls shrivel. David one was mad. He wanted Xana uh, for dumb youngins like. Ethan, tutors are assigned. David, too, blew it with Ethan. Ethan is a second-year fresher. Uh, David, too, also self-conscious about his um, racist word blood um, and, and talks trash. David, one, and David, two, talked about this in general for a while. Talked about leaving their phones behind and on YouTube on autoplay. No pings, no guns, too loud. Area dead early Sunday mornings. See, that's what I was thinking the whole time is that it's really dumb to commit a crime like this as Koberger in his car driving through university towns that have so many cameras on a Sunday morning when everyone is passed out drunk after a game. Mm -hmm. That's like, I feel like the dumbest time you could do it. Yeah. Because yeah. you are immediately going to be identified. Yep. Yep. And no, I feel I like he would you. know that, especially considering he's a criminologist in Pullman with access to CCTV footage. I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and for you, for you guys and that the will see this on the screen too, um, I want you guys to listen to a very important part here. So nicknames are being used here. Okay. And I have evidence to prove that as well, uh, which I'll put on the screen. So actually, what am I, where am I at here? Okay. So remember I'm there. I'll put up on the screen right here. This is the Sigma Chi uh, frat social media posting a, a remembrance for Ethan, okay? They say, fly high, E. We will miss you forever. That's from Sigma Chi Brothers, posted on their social media. So that is evidence. It's not somebody guessing like, well, we don't really know if we they called him E. No, they did. They did, all right? They called him E. They called uh, Maddie Mads. and. Uh, you know, Kaylee, bec because of the size of her chest. So, um, I don't, obviously, like, talking like that is not important. I think it takes away from the story altogether, and it makes it hard for me to read it. That's why I'm trying to uh, change those words. We did it like that the first time, too, because what's important is the content that's being talked about here, right? Yeah, because um, people will get offended by some of the names when really, before this crime happened, they were maybe a bit objectifying, but what college guy isn't objectifying women? Right. Um, but, I mean, because that's, that's what's running through your blood at the time. Testosterone, you know? Yeah. And also, but they're terms of endearment usually at the same time. That's yeah. what a nickname is. That like that's what you're known for, and that's why people like you, yeah. kind of thing. It's it's yeah. a term of endearment, usually. So yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. So uh we'll 
try and get through the rest of them here. Uh, uh, David too even calls out the crap media media saying Kaylee was target. That is false. Kaylee's bad luck. Targets were Ethan, Zana, and Maddie Mads. Maddie talked about David one, never acknowledged David two. Uh, Maddie right about that one. He is an idiot. David one should have taken out David two. WKF dirty South Loach WKF dirty South David one and Ethan hated each other. Uh, David two got a bid for a house because the GPA sucked and uh, the fraternity was on their butts about it. David two is schizo dirty South and Ethan could not be more opposite. Mads did talk crap. Dirty was also pissed with Rogaine. Jack had to charge no plug. Mads was also the target. Kaylee was not the target. Just bad luck. That's a known fact. High probability some brothers are aware. Rogaine has ample opportunities and will play grieving boyfriend. David, too, actually talked about this in detail in the past. Wearing elect electrician's glove, putting on baggy clothes after, and walking away. By the way, David Two's dad works for a professional cleaning company that was disposed of in Garden City during Thanksgiving weekend. And then this one talks about the four different people, and this is really important. So it says it... You know, you know, something interesting I wanted to point out that you read back, like it was not that message you just read, but the one before it, uh -huh. um, they mentioned cell phones, like leaving them Correct. running at home, which is interesting because this is before Koberger and the cell phone pings when we're all like, why wouldn't you just leave it home running? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. So you're telling me they wouldn't be smart enough to leave Xana's TikTok running or make a DoorDash order? Yep, yep. I'm I'm gonna read this one more. Uh, there's a couple more uh, uh, 4chan posts that aren't as important, you guys. But this one is okay, and then we can go through the evidence. So it was a thrill kill, joked about for a while, that became real in early November. They had thought about this for a long time, some up to a year classic behavior okay uh some sense high school in jokes in and in their imaginations even bought four identical knives as a gag coveralls for the laughs picked out lakes and fire pits to get rid of stuff right it i mean that's beyond joking in my opinion um yeah clearly they split it they split up to watch the roommates all night at the Sigma Chi party, at the, I'm not going to say that word, at a bar, at the truck, they worked up the courage doing drive-bys of 1122 King, checking the house lights before they stashed uh, kill kits and fresh clothes for after, for after. Drop the girls off because they are explainable if caught sneaking in and settle the dog in the empty room. Getaway car is parked a little way from the house as the meetup if they ever had to scatter. With anywhere from two to five killers in the house, it's easy to subdue the drunk sleepers quickly and quietly. Everyone heads to their preferred victim and stabs away. The basement girls were the least offensive, so would have been last, but locked doors and... Already having their kills, they swap their murderware for average Zoomer stuff and head to the car. <clears throat> they find themselves behind some kids getting busted that night and have to take a longer route to the car. So it takes a bit to get back to, to Bridget's. Wait for the flock to flee town when news hits for cover out to... Uh, you know, middle of nowhere to burn the clothes, gloves, mask, toss the knives in the lake and get that car detailed. Only uh, Bridget and Frats need to get through Barney's early interviews in can 
with canned responses and now just keep everyone drunk and messed up so the weak- weakest link doesn't squeal. Okay. This is at 1214. Okay. And you verified the the number? Mm-hmm. The ID is the same as all the others? No, no. There's two different the, there's two different writing here. Two different people writing. Okay. But you, you can tell in their Tw- writing style it's different. 1214. Did anybody know about the guys running in the background of the Banfield footage yet? I I'm gonna have to look it up. I don't believe so. I don't believe because so. Because that sounds exactly like Banfield. That that's why I wanted to get through this because there's some really major pieces of evidence that I feel like a lot of people miss here. Okay. The big one that we've talked about before is the four people running through Banfield. Okay. And uh the other one is the uh the kill kits and the gloves and the baggy clothes being able to take that off we know the crime scene was at least somewhat controlled right we know that there's a latent footprint there right <gasps> uh what if you had people helping you change that's why there's no tracks because these people are standing outside the door why one person's going in attacking and they have the bag and you stand there and change and a latent footprint is a mishap they just wipe up as they're leaving yeah look you guys i think this is a very real possibility okay if if there's evidence proving brian koberger ends up not being the guy exculpatory yeah. yeah i i think that it's very possible police do this we've covered stories over and over and over and over and over again and i'm not coming at this in an offensive way dude look but at christopher police, tap look at christopher yeah tap. police do this all the time they think they got a lead okay and you have a suspect that maybe is calling in a different lead every day on a different phone. Okay. Somebody that's that knows tech, I could call in with a number, different number every single day. Every single day, a different number. I can use voice changers. I can use all kinds of stuff. So that once you all of a sudden they they start realizing and tracking these leads, like, wait, we have like 10 people pointing out this one person's name. We need to look into this guy. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden you have law enforcement doing this. Is this a possibility? Or you see one little lonely white Hyundai Elantra driving down Main Street and you think, hmm, that's weird. Yeah. Does this explain? And then there's a white car in the neighborhood and you just assume that's the car. Right. Does this explain? The four people we see running that that little bit of unplanned, you know, you know what would prove this Hmm. is if police pulled the records for these people. We we definitely have three names here. Okay, one of them is a female and then we have two Davids. Police need to pull their cell phone info, their background application data was YouTube running. If it is, and we said this last time, if it is, then we have problems here. Major problems. And it says they drove by the house. Uh, It says they were stalking them. That's what it says. Yeah, but didn't it say they made multiple passes in a car? It said that night they split up between the groups of people. So... There were people watching Ethan and Xana at Sigma Chi, and there were people watching Maddie and Kaylee. Jack. Showalter. But I he's mean, not in Sigma Chi. No, I, I don't know if it... I, I have no idea. That, that To me, that's a 50-50 flip stretch. I have no idea. Yeah, he's not even in Sigma Chi, though, so that yeah. doesn't even make sense. Yeah, I just have no idea. I've never looked into him at all. I have no idea. Um... But was he with them making sure they were okay? Yeah. Yeah, he probably was. And I also don't think that's weird either. No. I mean, being a a drunk girl in a college town, clearly from the statistics, is pretty dangerous. (laughs) You know? And they were wasted. And they were all at the bar together. 
So it makes sense to walk them home just to be nice. You know what would prove this? Mm. A very skilled blood spatter expert. There's no way all these people are the same height. There's no way all these people have the same length of arms. There's no way all these people uh, did the motion in the same way on both floors. There would be variances from the crime scene. And that's something that Ann Taylor could look into, right? We know how, mon how many photos there are. There's like 10,000 photos. There's a lot. Yeah. And should be should be reaching out to one of the nation's leading spatter experts and having them look into this, in my opinion. I agree. I think there's enough here. So for you guys that are listening, that are new viewers, one of the 4,000 new since last time this came out, none of this information was out yet. No. None of this information is out, okay? Now, the Brian Koberger aspect, do I think it could be somebody setting somebody up? Sure, I do. However, the uh, the nicknames are really important, you guys. They are. Really important because these are the nicknames that only somebody close to them would know. Yeah. They would. And what's interesting here is we hear all of these things that we, that the community has put together as what would make sense, right? What makes sense to control a crime scene in this way? Oh, a kill kit to make sure that you're not dragging DNA out with you, uh, getting it done inside the house, you know, doing the deed, changing whatever. Uh, that's here before anything has come out. Leaving your phone running. At home. Yeah. That's stuff that was said too. Yeah. I don't know, you guys. I hope that, uh, you know, this is as interesting for you. For me, it's concerning. It makes me nervous. Uh, I, I, I hope the police have looked thoroughly into these people. Um, it's, it, it makes me nervous hearing that one of these four people is some big shot. And because they're a big shot in the state or their family is, that means that you didn't look into them like shame on you. Uh, if that's the case, um, Another interesting thing is that one of these, so these two people are no longer at that school. They are no longer at this school. Okay. That's another key piece of evidence. Okay. Um, now, two of the locations that they claim have been traveled to, you know, you know, those locations are on our analytics on our 4chan video as some of the highest watch time. And it's like a random city. No way. Yeah, it's not a major city. That's super creepy. Yeah. Yep. Jeez. Well, if you're watching over there, I mean, you can reach out. We can chat. Yeah. You know that family that you were talking about? Um, it's known as a mystery people of Europe. Because their presence has been speculated since prehistoric times. And people track it through Ancestry.com. It's what? That family you were talking about. That's like a big shot family. Really? It's dated back to prehistoric times. Wow. That's and interesting. And people track it like, you know, there's videos on, oh, I'm this. I, I have that DNA. What does it mean? You know, like, because it's a super important and special mysterious people huh that's interesting it's really weird actually really interesting. i'm gonna have to look more into it now because i'm super curious so essentially what we're saying here not not us what these are saying here is that to break it down and and you know compile it all together what is said to have happened is that 
there are these two Davids, and these two Davids were friends, okay? I know it says in here they were lovers. I have no idea, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. They're associated with each other for whatever that means. It doesn't matter. Um, and these two Davids had issues with Ethan, uh, and it started back when they rushed together, it sounded like. One of those Davids was uh, tutoring Ethan while his be it best friend was the other David that hated Ethan. So there was like some weird like teaching tutor triangle, it sounds like, whatever was going on there. They uh, got into an argument that night at Sigma Chi that everyone saw. Uh, Xana was involved and Ethan. It, it says in these messages there was some animosity because one of them actually wanted to be with Xana and, you know, she was with Ethan. Um, and it sounds like Maddie had their back and was talking trash because of that whole drama situation too. That is what caused Xana, Ethan and, and Maddie to be the targets. Okay. They, these people started joking about what it would be like to end somebody years ago. And, uh, it became more real and more real and more real over time till it became a point where they bought matching coveralls, Dickie's coveralls, and they, K bar knives. they bought matching knives. And we hear all the time there's K bars all over, uh, with Sigma Chi and that house and all over the place. Yeah, there's right? legit pictures. Yeah, no, there are legit pictures. And, um, they, uh, and it finally became real enough. There was enough, you know, drama between them where they decided to do it. So there were four people, four victims and the evidence of them running by. I mean, that that's interesting. You guys, that is very interesting. So they went and they watched. This was planned the entire day. They watched them that entire night. Once they went back, they prepped and got everything ready, set their phone up to play while they were gone. Um, and then they went in and, and did the deed and helped each other leave without leaving any evidence. So how, if this is real, how Brian Koberger's DNA got on the scene, I don't no. If they're smart enough to leave their phones running at home so that they're not tracked, aren't they smart enough to buy time uh, by making phone calls or opening TikTok or, you know, like ordering food? My only question, though, is like, why, how would they know Xana's passcode over Ethan's? We actually don't know if there was any activity on Ethan's phone that night. He's the only one who has apparently no cell phone activity because Xana's is mentioned. Kaylee's is mentioned. Maddie's is mentioned, mm -hmm. um, which almost makes me question. Was there none on Ethan's or did it not fit the narrative? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting. So, for sure. I mean, cause they're worrying about being tracked. Clearly they know something about phones. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They know that they know. you can be tracked easily with phones. And honestly, a lot of younger people these days feel like they're being spied on constantly by technology because that's common knowledge now mm -hmm. that you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're probably thinking like, well, we got to make sure it looks like they we weren't here this long. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. I'm Three glad other male DNAs on I scene. Clearly on items of importance because they only wanted to use the knife sheath because that is the most important object as everyone's argued well they got three other pieces you guys what's that from what are those important objects that they swapped yeah i mean you guys the the narrative fits like this is a theory that i think could be real uh objectively here not subjectively right and we don't have any buy-in whether this is true or not we're just trying to understand what the heck is going on and uh get justice for these victims because this should have never happened and if a story like this is real we have four people that can never and should never be out in public i don't care how much money you have burn it like <laughs> That means nothing. Yeah. For sure. 
whether you have a hundred dollars or a hundred million dollars, killing someone is still killing someone. Same thing. So I don't know. I'm curious what you guys think about it. I, I would like to know and hear from our other half of the new subscribers. Um, have you guys heard of this before? Because it, it, it gets brought up every once in a while, but it hasn't really been dug into a lot. Uh, I might even start a 4chan frat boy um, playlist, you know, and just put all of them in there because um, I think it's a realistic possibility. I do. I do too. So I don't think it's that illogical or far fetched, to be honest, like at all. And I think that, um, you know, People don't put enough weight in fraternities and the secrecy and the brotherhood. There's weight in that. It matters. Yeah, it does. It does. It, whether you want to believe that or not, it matters. Um, and to some people, it really, really matters. Yeah. Um, like it's everything. So I don't know. Let us know what you think. And we will continue this topic later. Yep. To be continued. Okay, so there has been a picture circling the internet um, among people who don't trust what's going on in Delphi, Indiana with the Abby and Libby case. Um, you know, Brad Holder was mentioned in the Franks Memorandum um, by Richard Allen's defense attorneys uh, and he was a su like a suspect of the public, not only the public though, because uh, we have that new document about them destroying the state, destroying sculptory evidence because he was interviewed about the crime only three days after it happened along with Patrick Westfall. Um, but he was suspected by the public very early on because of the really weird things he was posting on social media, like Odinist type stuff. Uh, Freemasonry stuff. Um, also, like, pictures that looked like the crime scene. Like, oddly similar to the crime scene. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of strange stuff. And he started taunting the public, like, putting on a, a hat that people thought looked like Bridge Guy uh, and, and provoking people. Um, in the Franks Memorandum, you know, there were things said by his ex that you know, he literally accused Patrick Westfall of doing it and um, a group of people known as the Vinlanders and that they also had a hand in the floor of fires. Um, there's a lot of allegations in that Frank's memorandum surrounding him and Patrick Westfall and other other men. Um, Elvis Field supposedly literally confessed and said he spit on the bodies like there's horrible things mentioned in the Frank's memo and. It's insane to learn that there is a connection between Brad Holder and the prosecutor of this case. Yeah. It's like almost absurd. Uh, does that say which lodge? Yeah. Okay. So this picture um, shows Brad Holder as a 33rd degree Freemason. At the Tipton Lodge in Logansport, Indiana. And we now have a picture of Prosecutor McClelland um, at the Tipton. The Tipton Lodge also posted that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it says he's a member of the Mount Zion Lodge in Camden. Um But he apparently got a re award or something in Tipton yep. Lodge. MM degree received his MM degree this evening in Tipton Lodge number thirty three. Yep. And remember, thirty three is like their number. It is their number, mm -hmm. very much so. Um, it's the highest if you're a thirty three degree Mason. Um, at least in I think the Scottish right, I believe, but. It, that to know they go to the same lodge is kind of disturbing. It's disturbing because it makes you wonder if it could alter the course of an investigation. Now, 
I want to mention that Prosecutor McClelland was not the prosecutor on this case when it first happened. The prosecutor on this case was Robert Ives. Robert Ives, I tried to look into to see if he was a member of the lodge. And while I can't any find anything definitive right now, I do have an obituary. And this obituary is for an Elizabeth Betsy Ives, um, 41 of Logansport, formerly of Delphi, formerly of Delphi. Um, she died March 23rd in 2000. Um, at her residence. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go into all of her details, uh, but her brother is Robert T. Ives of Flora. Wow. And Betsy Ives, Elizabeth Betsy Ives, was buried in the Masonic Cem Cemetery in Delphi. Now, when you look up the Masonic Cemetery, all I can find on it is that it used to be under the jurisdiction of Delphi, but since they have moved it to, um, not literally moved this, the cemetery, but it's now being maintained by Deer Creek. Okay. And it has there's a bunch of weird financing mumbo jumbo in this article. Um, I'd be interested to talk about it on, you know, the true crime talk show, maybe go into it more. Um, because I, I don't understand all the, you know, financy stuff that has to do with it. Um, but it says the Deer Creek Township has assumed ownership of the Masonic Cemetery known as the Mount Olive Cemetery at the corner of Armory Road and Hamilton Street in Delphi. The group voted Monday to purchase a sign for the cemetery for $400. Um, according to the Carroll County Area Planning Commission office, there are regulations about signs and permit must be obtained before installation. Trustee Doris McClelland presented a township board members, uh, presented township board members, David McCain, Janie Smith, and Jane Abbott, with a resolution to allow 25000 short-term loan from the township fund to be added to the Parks and Recreation Fund. McLeland said there is not enough in the Parks Fund to meet obligations, such as a request for Mike Patty for $15,000 for the L&A Park. Mm -hmm. See, like, it's... I don't know. It's like... It's a whole bunch of, like, town financy stuff. Yeah. But it's also interesting that, like, the lady's name that is in charge of all this is McClelland. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> like how tight knit is this community? It is real tight. It's a tiny town. It's super like, tiny. Extremely small. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. So um, I started digging into the history of Delphi a little bit. And I wanted to like go back to the legend of Delphi. Okay. So Delphi is based, it was named after the, like the town of Delphi in Greece. And if you know anything about like masonry, you know that they, they draw symbolism from all kinds of places. And usually it's supposed to mean something positive, like wisdom or, you know, they built strong structures, <laughs> you know? Um, and they say that, all of this stuff is like supposed to build a better man. Like that's their goal at the end of the day. If you watch any documentary where a Mason is telling you what their organization is about, it's about being a better person. Literally. Yeah. That's what they say. Um, but so this is a secret society. Okay. Is what this website says and it's literally from national geographic the oracle of delphi in ancient greece citizens who had burning question who had a burning question could seek the god's wisdom through oracles and there was no more influential oracle than the one at delphi 
reaching its peak influence between the 8th and 6th centuries BC. The massive temple dedicated to the god Apollo stood at the heart of the Delphi sanctuary that on most days served as a place of worship. But for nine days a year, the temple became an oracle when a special medium called the Pythia received a select group of visitors who had made a sizable donation for the privilege. Um, on the appointed day, Pythia, usually a young woman and Delphi native, would drink and bathe in the waters of the Casotis Kas Kas fountain. She then entered the temple to take her place in the inner sanctum, the Adatin. The oracle herself never spoke. Instead, she entered into a trance brought on, according to the Greek his historian Plutarch, by mysterious vapors. Hmm. writhing and convulsing as she uttered strange sounds and cries. The priests interpreted these utterances and produced a response which gave them tremendous power, uh, especially if the question pertained to an important political matter. Um, so basically historians have looked into this and said there's a fault underneath the town and it did give off vapor and gases that induced like these states. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's weird. It's way weaker now. They said it would have been way stronger back then when this was going on, and it's gotten weaker and weaker over time. Mm. Um. So, you know, I'm not going to go into, like, the history of Freemasons because that's available all kinds of places, um, and you guys can do that research yourselves. But I did go back into the history of Delphi, Indiana, which I thought was really, really interesting as I looked into it. Um, because it seems to me to have really deep roots in Freemasonry. Um, and this isn't conspiracy. Like, the Grand Lodge of England, there were Masons that came over from there and literally fought to separate America from England. And they created a society here. Hmm. Like, yeah. so all of the lodges in Indiana came from Kentucky. Okay. They came from Kentucky and they, I, I actually don't remember the first one. I think it, it's some V name, like Tennessee. I don't remember the name of the first one in Indiana. Um, but I do have a document showing it. I, maybe I can look at it in a second. But this is about the county history. Um, so Carroll County is actually named after Charles Carroll of Carrollton. He is the only surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence at that time. And he was a prominent Freemason. Um, mm. Samuel... So in 1828, General Samuel Milroy presented a petition for the formation of Carroll County named after, you know, Charles Carrollton. Um, and Samuel Milroy is a Freemason. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. So the first settlers had come to Carroll County at the end of 1824 to the Delphi area. The earliest Randos. families were headed by Abner and Henry Robinson and also Samuel Milroy. There's also a bunch of other names here. Um, by 1826, there were hundreds of settlers. They built cabins, cleared the heavy timber for roads, farmland, built sawmills and grist mills. Um, they mainly came from Ohio, Virginia, and Kentucky. And the lodges built in Indiana were mostly from Kentucky, but there were some from Ohio as well. Um, the county seat of the government was first called Carrollton, but was soon changed to Delphi. Now, for whatever reason, they claim Henry Robinson founded Delphi, like was the first settling family to settle Delphi and that he named it. But I don't know if that's actually true. Like, I don't know if there's a historical document stating that. And if he's if Samuel Milroy has to do with the creation of this county and Del and Delphi, he literally lived in Delphi and died like very near there. Like they probably all had a hand in naming Delphi. 
And Delphi is, there is significance to Delphi and Freemasonry, and I'm going to show you how. So I have these pictures, and I got them from a Masonic Lodge who literally posted them explaining the history. Um, so the Delphic tripod, base of Delphinian tripod, is a powerful symbol in Freemasonry. And it represents the importance of education in the Masonic journey. The tripod is made up of three serpents, which represents the three pillars of Freemasonry, wisdom, strength, and beauty. The serpents are intertwined, which represents the interconnectedness of these three pillars. Like, likewise, the three heads of the serpent support the three feet of the tripod, representing the foundation of an education. It's also a reminder of importance of learning from the past. It was original, originally a religious symbol in ancient Greece, and it was used in the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle was a place where people came to seek wisdom. You know, we, already, we just learned about that. In the craft, Delphic tripod represents the importance of learning from the past in order to build a better future. So that is it. And that symbology is used all over Freemasonry. Yeah. And that's from the Oracle of Delphi. And Delphi is the seat, the seat of Carroll County, which is named after the last signer of the Declaration of Independence that was alive and is a prominent Freemason. That's interesting. Now, Freemasons at this time when America was being settled, they had military chapters and all kinds of things. They were literally foundational in building the United States. They were super important. I mean, we know our first president was a Freemason. It's all yep. over the place. Look at the dollar bill. Look at every little tiny speck of a town. It has a Freemason lodge. Yep. Every single one. It does. Now, there are, while we don't know everything about Freemasons, we know some things and we know that there is an oath that when a Mason needs your help, which they have to do this certain sign, you have to help them no matter the cost, even if it's your own life. That's an oath they make. It's an oath they make that if they do this certain sign, which is the sign of distress or whatever, I can't remember the name of it, you are bound to help them no matter what. And there are penalties for breaking your oaths. Now Jeez. the penalties are gory and terrible. You can look them up if you want. They're absolutely horrible. Um, I don't know if that stuff is actually in practice or if they literally are all just symbolic, you know, or if people just follow them because they don't want to find out, but there have been people to leave Freemasonry and they weren't hurt. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. They weren't hurt. Um, but it does make you wonder, like, I'm not saying there's this huge cabal of Freemasonry that's controlling the planet or anything, but when you have people in a town, all, like, especially when it comes to judges, law enforcement, all the prosecutors, all the important people who help run the town and the justice system, and you have somebody who's suspected of a crime, a part of your fraternity are you going to be honest right in my opinion that's bias right there it's you a need secret to fraternity yourself. yeah it's a secret fraternity like it's, I mean, a, it's a brotherhood not so secret the putting it on facebook and it re it i understand that but that's not the point of a secret society is for yeah. it to literally be secret yeah I know. it's that you take oaths and they are secret. Yeah. And I've even heard it described by some historians and people who know things like experts, I guess you could say that it's actually a secret society within a secret society. Hmm. It's a brotherhood within a secret society that is secret. So like it's built in layers. So, I mean, we know that there's degrees of it. Yeah. And the higher you go, the more intimate your knowledge. Even Scientology is kind of built that way, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, but I have one more thing because I I mean it begs the question like when you have a town that's literally built by Masons and prominent figures, as we know, are a part of it, and it's hard honestly, it's really hard to find 
it depends. Some people are open about their membership to, you know, Freemasonry and some people aren't. Um, I know there's been connections made to like Elks and Moose Lodges and, and lots of other ones. Like I saw one situation where there was a Freemason who was like over, uh, um, their lodge who was also over an Elks Lodge, like mm. at the same time. That's interesting. Okay. So, and Shriners, apparently you have to be a 33 degree Mason to be a Shriner, which is also interesting. And those yeah. places are all over the country. Like they are, they are everywhere. They're yeah. every town in America, pretty much. Um, which doesn't, I'm not, again, that's not saying anything, but it does make me question the ties here. Um, now, so one interesting thing about Judge Gull, okay. And I, I have no idea how deep any of this runs, if it runs deep at all. There could be no connection at all. Okay, we we commit on this podcast to exploring even the wildest ideas. So I'm just giving you the facts that I've learned. Um, you do with them what you will, but never harass anybody. Never go out there and hurt anybody. Never. Never. But don't even contact people. Do not even call people. Yes, please don't call people. Um, it is an interesting thing to think about. And, you know, if you can find more information on it, cool. But uh, just know that a lot of these records with certain members are are hidden. Like I had a really hard time finding anything at all on specific people in the area. But what's interesting is you can start to find familial ties. So you can find their great grandfather was a Mason or this person was a Mason within their family. And the thing about Masons is, you know, a Mason father really wants their son to become a Mason. Yeah. It's a lineage thing. It matters to them. Um, which, you know, a lot of fathers want their sons to follow in their footsteps. Um, and I'm sure there's benefits to being a Mason, especially if you want to assume a career that has, you know, where you need connections. Yeah. Uh, so there is a man called Dennis Shabig, and he is the secretary um, on the board of directors for the Shepherd's House in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He is a Shriner. He is a 30, so therefore he is a 33rd degree Freemason. And Judge Francis C. Gold's name is on the supporter list for that organization. Hmm. And Shriner. Or I mean, not Shriner. Yeah, the Shriner guy, Shabig or whatever, Dennis Shabig, is a Fort Wayne retired police officer. And isn't it interesting that Judge Gull, the day she had two lawyers kicked off the case and the also simultaneously the only day she had cameras in the courtroom... She did it in the courthouse in Allen County that has a giant Freemason symbol on it. Yeah. On the wall. Yeah. Because it was built by Freemasons. Hmm. For the county. Interesting. I have no idea. I don't know either. It's just it's just questions. I don't know. But I mean, I thought it was interesting knowing that Brad Holder and McClelland literally go to the same lodges. Now, I couldn't find anything on Westfall being a part of anything. Um, you know, I was asked a question by you, actually, when I talked about talking about this to you, that don't you have to be a Christian to be a Freemason? No, you can believe in whatever you want. You don't even you could be an atheist. It doesn't matter. Interesting. It You can believe in whatever you want, as long as you believe in their beliefs, which is the grand architect and all that stuff. Yeah. And the light. That's all you have to believe is what they believe. Wild. So, I mean, it makes me want to look more into like, because the fact that evidence was deleted of Brad Holder 
like his interview and they never pursued search warrants for his phone is shocking. And it makes me wonder if that's the connection. Is Robert Ives a part of this lodge? Because, you know, all of these lodges actually in the area and surrounding areas of Delphi were, um, they were condensed into one, which is that lodge, um, Mount Zion Lodge. I think Tiptoe or whatever that lodge was. I can't yeah. remember. <laughs> and, yeah, Tipton and Mount Zion are really the only ones around this area at this point. Even the Delphi Lodge merged with Mount Zion. Whoa. So a so lot they're... of people from Delphi in the surrounding areas go to the same lodge. So they're communicating together. And that's the they important are. overlap there is that there is some evidence of associating with each other in the public. Yeah. Outside of the case, which could then, you know, make interactions within the case. Biased, questionable, and maybe somebody else should be looking into it. How many other people are part of this Mason Lodge in the area? Uh, how serious do they take their oaths? Um, you know what I mean? Like, those are really important questions they are it makes me wonder how many people maybe this isn't an like just an odinist issue maybe it's yeah. also an issue of just interconnectedness in you know societies like this in small towns in small towns yep. like it, I know. and delphi clearly has a deep-rooted history in masonry and then you add, I mean, this Odinist thing on top of it. Now, I've heard some arguments out there that some of the evidence at the crime scene also has some weird symbol symbolism that connects to Freemasonry, too. Um, and actually, I did find some evidence for it. Hmm. But I don't know if I really want to talk about it because it's kind of going out there a little bit. But it kind of actually makes a little bit of sense. There's just one aspect to it that doesn't. Hmm. I'd, I've never heard of a Freemasonry murder like that though I have no idea I couldn't even give any input on that I don't know I don't know I don't we know only have that one it. of the like first guy a really long time ago hmm. remember you did that whole story oh 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 gotcha what is his name yeah, yeah I don't remember William Morgan or something yeah I think you're right I think it is. I don't remember. Morgan. I don't remember. But anyway, there's some overlap there. Um, knowing that a lot of the lodges condensed, knowing that there's a deep rooted history here, that there's multi generational, which I heard Brad Holder is uh, from a lineage of Masons, and so is McClelland. Um, and I think there's a possibility for the old prosecutor to be a Freemason as well, and Judge Golby associated as well. Um, it's concerning. It's just concerning. Yeah, it is. Because it's making also multiple um, cities also connected. Not just Delphi, but like they're condensed to like only a few lodges. Yeah. Interesting. It's also interesting to note that they take an an oath in Freemasonry that like when a member asks for a favor, they're not supposed to turn it down. So, I mean, my only thing is like, I don't know if all this, cause like, just like religion, Freemasonry's use a lot of metaphor. So it's like, what is real and what is just metaphor? Yeah. What is just symbolic and not real practice and what is not? Because I have a hard time going full tin hat land where I'm like, oh, yeah, like it's all that. Like there, there's a cabal, you know, yeah. I can't go full out that way. Um, but humans are going to human. You know what I mean? And if there's a, a tight knit connectedness among these people, I don't know. Like, I think it's possible, like, people do cover up for people sometimes. It happens. And this case has such weird situations in it that aren't making sense. And it makes you wonder. Yeah. Where's the infiltration? Where is this corruption coming from? Like, where is this the beginning of it? Where's the bad egg? 
that's making the whole place smell. Yep. I don't know. I just want to know what you guys think about it. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever really brought it up and talked about it before, other than just pictures posted around the internet. Um, I, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good information for sure. Um, I think that it could explain a lot because there's a lot of things that are unexplained. I, I mean... I wasn't going to talk about it until, because this picture's been out for a while, until the deleted evidence. Yeah. That connection matters. The fact that McClelland didn't, like, offer up any explanation right away and, you know, got them thrown off the case when they started asking questions and stuff. The things alleg alleged in there are pretty significant. And there's really, there's real proof, like factual proof proving, you know, I even have an article from the Carroll County Comet of McClelland um, at a lodge there too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, this is from 2011, that picture's from 2018. He's a longtime member. Yeah. Anyway, let me know what you guys think. I'm done. I got nothing more to say. I just want to hear your ideas. Tell me if you think it's absurd or if you think it makes some sense. I don't know. I've been literally researching it nonstop all day, and I just... <laughs> what to think? <laughs> yeah. It feels like too much. <laughs> yeah. But that's it. All right, that is it for the podcast, Thought Right Podcast. Make sure you do all the podcast things. Click all the podcast buttons. Leave a comment. Let us know how you like the show. And uh, we appreciate you all for being here. And that's it. No, he's lying. He doesn't. I care. I appreciate you for being here. Only. <laughs> yes. That is it for the show. So yes. We'll see you next time. Thank you all for being here. We will be live on the True Crime Talk Show Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central Time, where we dig deeper into the topics we just talked about. And we want you to be there. It's on YouTube and Twitch and now Twitter or X. All Wait, right. we're still doing it on X, right? Okay. Yep. So till then, be safe. Yep. See you next time.